Quiet on set, you damn kids. Who wants to make a short? We'll pay you an IMDb credits and experience. Lights, camera, action, it's I don't give a flick, your favorite film podcast, oh yeah. Tarantino, Mero, and Spielberg, here's looking at you, kid. We talk movies and TV shows, and sometimes other things we like. And no one's coming right at your fucking face, every minute of every day will never stop. We'll talk lenses, music, and foley. We'll understand the depth of field. We've got theories so out of this world and epic it'll blow off your fucking tits. Oh yeah, that was bullshit. (laughs) We're going to go down 60 movies and put them in tears. Yep. What the fuck is Shakes the Clown? I've never heard of that. <laughs> God damn don't, it. Don't, don't read ahead. Don't read All ahead, right. Johnny. Save it. Mix Save nuts. It. Damn it. <gasps> Save it, Johnny. So, uh, so Michael, tonight we are very excited to have you here. We really are looking forward to this moment in Michael, time. Michael, I've I was been telling this Gary wonderful that, moment to this wonderful moment of me that, literally being the only guest and having to rip Adam Sandler movies out of my ass <laughs> that I haven't seen in 15 to 20 years. Yes. Exactly. Yes. I think that will be a lot of fun. Let's uh, let's get rolling. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another impromptu episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I'm your host, Johnny Blackburn. And alongside me this week, as he is every week for some reason, no one invites him back. But it is Gary Elmore. And Neil Riley is not joining us this week due to a colonoscopy that went wrong. And or right. We wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, this week, we are very pleased to have with us Michael bringing the pain. Michael, welcome back. Thank you. Here I am. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Bringing the pain. Bringing the pain. Uh, uh, speaking of pain, what are we going to be talking <laughs> about in this episode? Uh, I, I want to I preface this by saying we had originally <laughs> set up like a few days in advance to do the greatest actresses of all time. Uh, and then at the last minute we had, uh, we had last one guest drop out and another episode, excuse me, another guest have to drop out due to technical difficulties. So we are here to you almost 1am on a Wednesday morning and for all you cool cats all you and cool kittens cats. out there. And uh, we are very fortunate Michael is able to join us for the episode we actually have been talking about on numerous occasions. For, yes, for a long time. And Too we long. finally get to do it, thank God. Uh, everybody's, possibly, if you look at commercial success, the greatest actor of all time, this guy is more famous than Daniel Day-Lewis, Dustin Hoffman, uh, Gene Hackman, even think of Jack Nicholson, famous, put together yeah. the one, the only... Adam Sandler, the Adam Sandman. Sandler. Flop, flop, flop. As a as a question, how much did it hurt you to have to say that? That uh, he is more successful than <laughs> folks like Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman. I don't even know who Daniel Day Lewis is if he was standing next to Adam Sandler. So we we were we were looking at this and we were talking with Michael about it outside on the phone when we were on a cigarette break and. Daniel Day Lewis has done approximately he's done about 20, 25 films over the over the where he's actually been like one of the leads or a major supporting role uh, throughout the last 40, 45 years that he's been acting. Uh, Adam Sandler in a 30 year span has done over 60. Yeah. And you, the quality you can tell. Adam Sandler is worth four hundred and twenty million dollars right now. OK, and Daniel Day Lewis's net worth, who we, many consider to be the greatest actor to have ever lived. His net worth is only 60 million, only 60 million, only 60 that million popper bastard. <laughs> now, granted, <laughs> who's going to go down as the more respected actor of all time? Well, Adam Sandler, because they'll know Adam Sandler's name and they won't <laughs> he, know Daniel Day Lewis. I Well, I don't know about that, but he, you, you go out on the street and you pull a hundred people, Johnny, and say, hold up a picture enough. of Daniel Day Lewis and Adam Sandler. <laughs> yeah. And I guarantee you the majority, <laughs> almost a hundred percent of them would probably know Adam Sandler. Probably 50%, maybe less would know Daniel Day Lewis. Maybe less. Maybe, maybe less. a lot less. You might be right. Uh, maybe we'll have to take an episode to the streets at some point. Taking um, it to the streets, y'all. But it's, it's just insane to me. 
dude, because th- this guy makes he makes 20 million an episode on top, excuse me, 20 million a movie on top of 20 to 25 percent of the profits of the overall film. You it's, might as well call it an episode because he makes a film like every five months. That's so, true. Yeah, that's true. His his uh, his most recent contract with Netflix was worth a whopping two hundred and fifty million dollars for four movies. Yep. Four movies. Yep. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. Yeah, that's that's not bad. So uh, <laughs> what we're going to be doing today is going through the filmography of Mr. Adam Sandler. Uh, some rules are uh, we are only going to talk about movies in which he was an actor, even if it was a small role. Mm-hmm. And we're going to put these movies into one of three tiers. Tier one is going to be a good movie. Actual classics. Yeah. Actual something. Yeah. And doesn't necessarily mean it's something that's uh, like acting well, but something that's like good and entertaining and it's fun to watch. Sure. The movie uh, we're saying movie as a whole, not just his performance. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. Uh, tier two is going to be, Meh, you know, uh, the world might have been okay if this movie hadn't been made. And uh, tier three is what I like to call the Jack and Jill tier, oh, um, in which we're going to just put the absolute uh, poopy that he's made into that tier. Okay. These are movies that are <laughs> so awful that you have to ask yourself, why do, God? Do these people, is, does God exist? Does God exist? Does God exist? Is everyone clear on the rules? Uh, yep, I'm, I'm prepared for an existential crisis. Let's go. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know, well, we'll start with, with just a little backstory. Uh, Adam Sandler had started off in the 80s as a comedian on the New York circuit, uh, had been found around 1990 uh, by Lorne Michaels uh, when he had gone ahead and auditioned for SNL. He then went ahead and was on the show for close to five seasons uh, before he and Chris Farley actually were both fired from the uh, from the franchise. Uh, <laughs> and that that will go. We would go into that on another episode because there's a lot of film to uh, go ahead and look after here. But a lot. Either way, uh, this guy has literally been possibly been the biggest movie star in Hollywood consistently over the last 30 years. Um, I can't think of anybody that has had as long of a run, even to this day, if you slapped his name on top of a movie poster and said, it's just build it as an Adam Sandler film. He would have an audience to come and see it. I mean, they would, they would, they yeah. would clear 50 to hundred million easily. Easily. Yeah. Um, um so yeah. let's jump in. Let's jump into it. Gary, why don't you start us off? What's first on the list? What, what's the first Adam Sandler movie ever? Okay, the first listed Adam Sandler movie is the 1989 classic Going Overboard, where he <laughs> played the role of Shecky Moskowitz. <laughs> um, now, I have not seen this movie, nor heard of it. I have seen it, actually. Okay. I watched it about two years ago because I was really bored late at night, okay. and I was up and just decided... I love Adam Sandler, even if his even if some of his movies are shit. Uh, and I'm going to check it out. And it was not good okay. at all. Okay. In fact, it was so underwhelming at the box office <laughs> that they had actually gone ahead and re-released the movie after Happy Gilmore came out, like right afterwards, due okay. to the success, the commercial success of it. Um, and it's still underwhelmed <laughs> both times. Fair enough. But uh, yeah, so that that's 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 that. Um, Michael, have you seen this movie? I have not. I have never even heard of it. If you told me there was a movie like Going Overboard, I would immediately think of like the Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau movie Mm -hmm. where they were old people on a cruise ship. Just the only (laughs) thing I would be able to think about. Data was also in that movie. He was. He was was the uh, cruise director, I believe. Mm -hmm. I was out to sea. Okay. Yes. I always mix the two up. I had always thought that Going Overboard... For, I would always get that mixed up with the really good Goldie Hawn, Kurt Russell film from uh, from the 80s. I think it was the 80s. That's just Overboard. Oh, OK. Yeah. And then once I saw it on Netflix, I, I thought to myself, well, that looks like a terrible train wreck. I'm going to love it. And then it was just a terrible train wreck. And I did not love it. It so, was very sad. To so, see. Johnny, what? Tier does going overboard land in? Tier three, absolutely. This is this is this is on a Jack and Jill level for sure. Um, I mean, it's it's his first movie. He literally just takes he mixes the characters of Little Nicky and w- the Water Boy essentially. And Jesus, that's okay. Uh, you know, it's Bobby Boucher and <laughs> and Little the Son Nicky. of Satan yeah. just 
on a cruise ship and a bunch of shenanigans ensue and that's it it's it's pretty horrible okay not, not his worst movie no but it, it is certainly not not a good one going overboard tier three the second film on the list is the 1991 movie <laughs> shakes the clown in which he played the role of dink the clown <laughs> I have not seen this This was directed and written by Bobcat Goldthwatt. (laughs) Okay. Okay. We were just doing impressions of him. Uh, I've never seen this film. I'm just pulling this off of Wikipedia right now, but it had Kathy Griffin. And I'm going to just put this movie in. And Robin Williams, a cameo by Robin (laughs) Williams as Mime Jerry. He used the pseudonym Marty Fromage in the film Shakes the Cloud. Okay. Moving on. I'm going to say tier three. <laughs> tier Never three. seen it. Tier Michael, three. how about you? You seen Shakes the Clown? Well, it, it had a, what, a budget of 1.4 million and only made 115,000 at the box office. So I'll go ahead and say the audience probably agreed with you. Okay. <laughs> tier three. Moving on to his first uh, big movie that he was in, 1993's Coneheads. I forgot in, he was in this. In which he played uh, the role of Carmen Wiener, uh, who was a uh, supporting <laughs> character. Now, Coneheads, I think, is a pretty great movie. Well, that's just a classic. Had had nothing. The be, it being a classic really had nothing to do with Adam Sandler. He really was True. barely in the film as it was. But according to the rules that we have established, I think we get to add a a, a good solid movie. Well, to that's him. a tier one then. Yeah, if we're just basing it off of yeah. you know it being carried we're, by we're Jane Curtin to. and and Dan Aykroyd, then uh, Michael, you agree with a tier one? I, I do. It's just hard to call this an Adam Sandler film without without just basically shitting on Dan Aykroyd and everybody, and everybody <laughs> else involved with it. I also think this was what the second Saturday Night Live like spinoff movie. I think the first one probably being Bru- uh, Blues Brothers. Yes. So I think this was only their second time out when they took a sketch and, and turned mm-hmm. it into a feature length film. And it was just like Blues Brothers, it was successful. I think we've talked about that in the past, that Saturday Night Live has that uh, running ability, especially in the 90s, to, to somehow produce successful feature-length films. Oh, absolutely. It was. It's certainly, it's certainly a springboard for anybody that had started a successful career. I mean, God, I mean, even... I mean, uh, the, Chris Farley, uh, David Spade were in that as supporting mm-hmm. roles. Um, there, were, there were a bunch. Yeah, there, there were a lot of was people. Was Tim Meadows in that? I don't think so. Okay. Um, but I mean, you know, but yeah, if you, if you just go back and you, and yeah, just playing off Michael's point, you look at any SNL, any large, like comedic actor that was primarily getting their start from the late seventies through the early two thousands, Will Ferrell, Tina Fey, even Jimmy Fallon to a point, you know, um, Bill Murray, there's a ton there. We could, we could list that all day. Um, but very true, Michael, very true. That's there's, there's, I don't know if there's, I don't know, like a franchise or god or series or anything like that that's been as successful as a springboard as uh snl was yeah yeah i can think even think anything um moving on next one uh 1994 airheads Ooh. in which he played pip the drummer his first uh major movie that was sort of a starring or a lead role was he a, was he a lead in airheads I was, guess? wasn't he one of the three guys <laughs> Yeah, he was part of the trio because it was um, it. Uh, it was Brendan Fraser, Steve Buscemi, and then Adam Sandler were the three that were in that right. band. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. Michael, it sounds like you've seen this movie. I have seen Airheads. Uh, I remember it. <laughs> I remember watching it for some reason a lot in middle school, which would have been years after it came out. But um, yeah, it was it was entertaining as a kid, mainly because I didn't understand half of the references that were in it, but it was still fun and campy i think it absolutely bombed at the box office like i don't think it did very well but it was fun the budget budget was 11.2 mil and the box office was barely under six million ouch definitely a loss so (laughs) so of his first four movies three of them have been absolute box office failures Mm -hmm. yet he keeps getting more it's interesting well he was young at the time and when we get to I've never heard of this next movie, but the movie after that, we will see the large jump that he hit right when he left SNL mm-hmm. and that catapulted, catapulted him in the mid 90s to becoming the star and success that we see today. So the other movie he did in 94. Oh, hey, oh, uh, oh Airheads. Oh, tier. Yeah. I'm going to I'm just tier personally going to go tier two. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Michael, you said you watched it a bunch in middle school, so you've probably seen it the most out of all of us. What would you rank it? 
Yeah, it's still a tier two film. I, I wouldn't call it like, oh my god, it's a cornerstone of cinema, but <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> okay, so tier two, I think we're all agreed on that. Sure thing. Okay, and then ninety four, he also did a movie called Mixed Nuts, where in which he played Louis Capshaw. <laughs> uh, Mixed Nuts uh, is a Steve Martin movie. Um, Another uh, box office bomb. Yeah, like <laughs> Steve Martin, Madeline Kahn. Like it, it actually had some really big names in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, not big box office appeal. Nope. Twenty million no. budget, seven million at the box office. Okay, <laughs> another colossal failure. <laughs> Four out of yep, five. But we're, I don't even. We're think still going to keep making movies, people. We are. I don't think I've seen Mixed Nuts. I've heard of it. I just I don't think I've ever seen this one, Gary. Uh, no, I have Michael? not seen it. Nope. Okay. And I know you, as the audience, are asking yourself, why are they doing a podcast on Adam Sandler when they haven't seen so many of his movies? It's out of this entire list. There's probably only a handful that I haven't seen. Well, we're I'm getting like, into his more famous ones, so. Um, mixed nuts. Sure. I'm gonna say, just looking at the picture of it and the cast, that it's probably a tier two movie. <laughs> We're just gonna <laughs> see. Yeah, you know the old saying, "Don't judge a book by its cover." That's Fuck what that. the cover's there for. <laughs> That's what the cover's there for. Judge a, apparently judge judge a movie. I'm an INTJ, its... Johnny. I have a very strong J. Uh, of course, of course yeah. you do, Gary. Mm. I know how much you you follow those, uh, Gary. Let's jump in. Okay. Let's jump into the golden era of Adam Sandler. Okay. Uh, 1995, he has his first breakaway leading role in Billy Madison, in which he played the titular mm. character, Billy Madison. Mm. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this one, just in general, is not only one of my favorite comedies of all time. It literally, between this and a couple of his other films we're about to mention in the 90s, just... I mean, just to find my childhood, my adolescent years. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I think in this movie, Adam Sandler and the people he, because he kind of starts forming his team here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that they really found their uh, comedic stride, right? And what what works for them and what didn't um, better than they had previously. And I think that uh, this movie is fun. It's fun to watch. It's really stupid. But so, I mean, like, you're not going to like walk away from it like you would a Shakespeare play, but it's an entertaining, <laughs> I think, that that can be said hands down. It's the first time we actually see him be himself with one of his, with bits and pieces of his characters that he had on SNL or that he had in his act when he was on the comedy circuit. And we actually see him start to put that into something that became the beginnings of commercial success. Not his most commercially successful film, no, but no. definitely getting in, getting into the golden years of of what he had. Um you know, I, I this one for me is a tier 1. You blame it on the nostalgia factor. I've still watch it when it comes on TV or if I see it streaming nowadays mm -hmm. personally. Um but you know, I think Brad that was the first movie I had seen Bradley Whitford in. And I just love it when he plays the antagonist, no yeah. matter no matter. We are what. all yeah. now dumber for having listened to you, <laughs> or stupider. Man, I'm glad I called, called that, that guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And like he like he started really developing like the timing, or I don't know if he found an editor that worked well with him, but the timing of the jokes was mm -hmm. uh, had gotten really tight. Um, and uh, I think it just really worked for me. I'm going to say this is a tier two movie. It's it's very what? entertaining, really. Uh, okay. But I, I don't think it breaks into the top tier movies of the Adam Sandler lexicon. Oh wow! I'm uh, okay. Uh, I'm about to rip into that. But Michael, what 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 tier do you think we're in? Uh, I would I'd probably put Billy Madison in a tier one. Um, when you when somebody asks, hey, name some Adam Sandler movies, it's almost always going to include Billy Madison, just because that was probably the first big one that people can remember absolutely and gary i'm gonna tell you why I, I i would rip into it just because not only is his production company named happy madison productions mm -hmm. as it being his you know the the beginning of his rise to prominence how does that I, have I just, anything to do with the movie <laughs> with the movie with the movie itself yeah with the tier of the movie that it belongs in he 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 named because that's his start Okay. That's that's the start of his genius. What if he had you know? called it uh, Air Cone Productions <laughs> or <laughs> Going Clown <laughs> or Heads Heads? <laughs> <laughs> well, those movies he all had smaller roles, and they weren't as they weren't as successful. True. I mean, if you if you look at how often he this movie Dinks the Clown, he did play Dinks the Clown. But if you look at how how many times this movie is is 
currently played and syndicated on so many different networks. Yep. You know, um, just the success that it's had, even if you don't think the comedy in it is pure gold like some of his other films that we're about to go into, you have to look at it from the memorable platform and where it started his rise. And I'm I'm not putting all of his tier ones to say these are the greatest comedies to have ever no, been around. Yeah. But as far as on his list, right. I mean, this is in this is in his top ten movies easily. And I think that easily falls into a tier one. Uh, hmm. I don't know if I'd say it's in the top ten movies of his, but I'm gonna I'm gonna still go tier two. But all you right. made a good argument, Johnny. Well, fair enough. Uh, moving on. 1996, uh, Happy Gilmore, the golfing movie oh, yeah. in which he plays the titular character, Happy Gilmore. <laughs> and uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, he, it's a golfing movie, um, which... Uh, you, get to see him, you get to see him attempt to knock out Bob Barker, yep. even though it, it goes horribly True. wrong. Is there a line in that that's famous? The price you- is wrong, bitch. Yep. Yep, that's the line. Bad impersonation, but that yeah. is the line verbatim. It kind of sounded like Jesse Pinkman almost. Oh, Price I like Jesse Pinkman. We should do an episode on Breaking Bad. But not tonight. Not tonight, though, because we got a lot to get. <laughs> we got Start a lot. over, kids. But here we go. Starting the entire episode over. Uh, but yeah, Happy Gilmore, it's a story of redemption and a man finding his his true purpose in the world. Thinks he's supposed to be a hockey player. Finds out he's actually the greatest golfer of his generation Mm -hmm. uh, beats out the uh, incomparable. Oh God. What is um, uh, some McDonald though? What is that guy's name? Oh, uh, Shooter Uh, McGavin, Shooter McGavin. Right. I was looking for the, for the actor. Um, That would be Mr. McDonald, Mr. McDonald, Andrew Andrew McDonald or Norm McDonald. Christopher. Oh, oh, Christopher. Christopher. Jesus. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Oh, it's Christopher. Oh, Christopher McDonald. Oh yeah. 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 Um, Michael, it's Christopher McDonald. If you, oh, thank you, thank you. If you notice, this is actually, uh, this is to my knowledge, this was the first movie that Dennis Dugan and him uh, collaborated on, and the majority of all of Adam Sandler's films that had been commercially successful, you'll find out that Dennis Dugan is always one of the producers, mm-hmm. typically will co-write with Sandler on these projects, and he always directs them. Um, kind of like um, uh, Will Ferrell with Adam McKay yeah, before he went yeah. off and did Big Short and all of his own stuff. But yeah, uh, again, as Johnny said, uh, like this is sort of the the, the formation of Sandler mania, mm-hmm. um, and uh, he's really tightening up his team. The humor that worked in Billy Madison continues to work in Happy Gilmore, and uh, I think a lot of people, you know, really enjoyed this movie. It was just a fun uh, movie, and everybody loves Shooter McGavin. <laughs> um, so I, for me personally, um, this is this is one of my this is one of my top three favorite adam sandler film so this is easily a tier one um just from from the quotable lines to it also being a, a sports movie <laughs> you know you know how <laughs> oh, much I so love- golf is a sport everybody you heard johnny say golf is a sport oh i just say that to mess with you okay. no i say nascar is not a sport <laughs> okay T- table tennis what, what is it a game like it's, 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 a it's, race. Be a sport. it's only a game michael <laughs> um i would yeah i would i would have to say for this one this is this one is easily a tier one. This one for me isn't debatable. Um, yeah, I, I give it tier one status as well. Michael. I agree. It's, it's definitely tier one. It's also, a uh, not only, uh, Adam Sandler and Christopher McDonald. I also really like Carl Weathers in it. Oh yeah. Yeah. As a, a uh, Chubbs, Chubbs is, baby. is the golf pro. He's like <laughs> losing his hand to the alligator. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Did you guys know that in the majority of random fact in the majority of his major films, his love interest typically has a uh, name that where the first and last name both start with letter V random fact. I did not know that. Yeah. I didn't know that either until, <laughs> until uh, someone had told me that a couple months ago. And I thought yep. that was very interesting. I, I did I, not know that either until I learned it. <laughs> until I learned it. Yes. Remember that one time I learned <laughs> something? I think not. I Most think likely. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so uh, tier one, I think we're Abs- all absolutely in, in on that. I mean, to this day, when we're out on the course, we're yep. still attempting the happy Gilmore shot. Yep. We're still, it's a terrible idea. The baseball never works. Into, yeah. a, into a drive. Yep. Um, our friend Nick decided to do that a couple of years ago and actually uh, tweaked his back. Yep. And he's an old man now. He is. He thinks he's, he's still a 30s. young kid, but he's an old man. He is. He really hurt himself. Yes, he did. Yeah. He's an old married man. Now. He is. You know, his life's only going downhill from here. 
So <laughs> good luck, Nick. Good luck. Good luck in your, in your uh, life. Uh, tier one for Happy Gilmore. Yeah, baby. 96 also had Bulletproof, in which he played Archie Moses. Never uh, never seen Bulletproof. I never saw Bulletproof I'm either. Not gonna, I'm not going to spend any personal time on it, because okay. it's probably one of his smaller movies. Michael? Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> I just know it had Damon Wayans in it, if I remember right. Okay. But yeah, I know nothing about that movie. <laughs> 1997, he took a break and made no movies, but it paid off because in 1998, he did The Wedding Singer, in oh which he God. played Robbie Hart. What a now, year. What a, what a year to, for him to work, dude. I mean, in 98. You, you know what makes me uh, uh, feel really old? Mm. So when The Wedding Singer came out, it took place in 1985, I right. believe. Mm-hmm. And so they're like, okay. oh, man, they're making so, so much fun of all the stuff from the 80s. That movie is now 23 years old. Oh, my God. <sighs> so, yeah. yeah we're getting Kill old. me now. We're getting old as hell. Yep. Womp womp. Uh, the Wedding Singer, absolutely. Like, it's a story about a man uh, who he's a wedding singer and he wants to write actual music and become famous, of course. And he falls. And this is his first pair up with Drew Barrymore. Right. Um, who yeah. if who. We had talked about this in our romance films. I think would give a Meg Ryan Tom Hanks combo run for their money of best rom com duos, duos of all time. If if they had if Adam Sandler had been a harder worker, I think they could have. We Jesus. don't know. We know that's not a fair assumption. We don't know if he's not a hard worker or not. He may just okay. he just plays these characters. We have okay. No idea. If he if he had challenged himself a bit more. How so? Jesus. What, well, well, no, it's okay. Well, it's mean, like, that's he, a fair. Yeah, he like. I'm just uh, curious how you. I, I mean, it seems like uh, with a lot of his movies, he kind of just is like, I want to go on vacation here, so I'm going to make a movie around what? wherever the place is. <laughs> the hell out of here, man! That's not how it went. <laughs> that's called working smart. Yeah, that just is called saying. working smart. Well put, Michael. Well yes. put. Uh, well, I'm Point not saying. I, I'm not saying at all that Adam Sandler is a dummy. I think that he, yeah, I think <laughs> he's sure. quite intelligent. Um, yeah, absolutely. But in the Wedding Singer, uh, it's his first uh, romantic. Kind of, uh, well, I mean, like, you know, that's uh, mostly centered on the romance. Sure. Uh, Happy Gilmore, of course, and Billy Madison had that in there, but I, I don't think of those as mostly a romance movie, whereas uh, The Wedding Singer, I do. Oh, it's a rom Wedding Singer is a rom com, for sure. Right. I, would, I would agree with you on that. Is it a paranormal? <laughs> is it a paranormal romance? <laughs> Um, but uh, no, you know, and actually, uh, that is another movie that he was in with our good friend, John Lovitz, yep. who we've wanted to have a cup, cup, of, cup coffee of coffee with, with John, John Lovitz, Lovitz for um, a long time. So John, come on out. Yep. We've been uh, calling your name out like every episode for over a year now. <laughs> uh, but John, come on out to the ballpark. Bring the kiddos. Bring yep. another kids. John Lovitz movie. Mm. <laughs> uh, mm. the, the Wedding Singer is really, um, I think, uh, helped by having an excellent soundtrack because it was sure. movie, uh, music from the 80s um, and it was well paced. This was actually um, like a, a really good movie. Yeah, like, overall, he it gave him a chance to also it, it gave him a chance to express his musical comedic chops, right. which is not something we had seen in any of his movies prior. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if you look back at SNL, like even, you know, he had the um, he had, you know, he had Lunch Ladyland. Uh, with Chris Farley, and then uh, I can't remember the name of the character that he played on their uh, n- uh, late night news hours. He was the the singing opera, opera man. man, just opera man, I think. Yeah. Right? Um, I am the opera man. It's very it's very Jack Black esque. You know, like he's right, actually yeah. not a he's a good performer, and he's actually not a horrible singer and mm-hmm. player. I mean, he's not. You know, he's no fucking Freddie Mercury or. Whoever else, if any, but, anybody else that plays the guitar, anybody else that plays the guitar, but uh, but it's entertaining enough, you know. This is a tier one for me, man. Yeah, I can't, t- I don't really solid tier one, uh, Michael. Yeah, it's it's definitely a tier one movie. Um, a lot of people fucking like this movie. Like yeah. Jesus, a lot of people like this movie. I don't quite understand it, but to each their own. Okay. Well. Let the, we'll leave that one there. That's okay. okay. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll just I mean, Neil, Neil, uh, Neil had said during our romance episode that his wife's favorite movie in general is The Wedding Singer. Right. And I did not know that. I've known her for years, and I never knew that was her favorite movie, and we talk about film all the time, so I'm surprised it never came up. Uh, in 1998, he also uh, had a small role in the movie Dirty Work, which was a uh, Norm MacDonald movie, uh, in which he played <laughs> Satan. Uh, dirty work. Um, I've never I've, seen you ever Norm McDonald. No, I've never seen Norm McDonald play the lead in anything. I've no, I never saw Dirty Work. Did you? Oh, okay. Yes, I did. Oh, okay. Um, it was a a tier two movie. Uh, it was a really? comedy. But yeah. Um, okay. 
he did not have a uh, he Adam Sandler did not have a very big role in this, but um, you know, it was a movie about just some working class guys and uh again the same kind of humor level of kind of like crass and crude um as the other movies we've been talking about and um a, a tier two movie which is like i'm not mad that it was made um but my life was not improved by seeing it okay was uh, uh chris farley's final film appearance by the way really yeah, yeah. okay yep no way okay i thought almost here was yeah okay but i mean it it did have a lot of people in it i mean just just these cameo people don rickles and john mm-hmm. goodman uh, Gary Chris Coleman. Was, yep. <laughs> I mean, just a lot of folks in this movie. Although looking at the uh, greatest movie I've not seen, but looking at the uh, cover art for it, it makes me think of that stupid how to get revenge movie with Linda Blair. Just how it's like at the bottom, it's like revenge is sweet. So all I can think about is that. Kind of reminds me of uh, the title, or uh, the uh, poster from Blank Check. Did you guys ever okay, see yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yep. it's yep. just the same thing with the sunglasses. So apparently this was also directed by Bob Saget, the actual Bob Saget, Bob from, Saget. Uh, from Full House. Okay, well, fair enough. Fair, fair enough. enough. Dirty work, tier two, apparently. We'll, we'll uh, take Gary's word on that one. All right. Uh, and then 98, he also did. Uh, what a year, man. The Water Boy, in which oh, he yeah. played uh, Robert Bobby, Boucher. Bobby Boucher. Bobby Boucher. Uh, Bobby, is, Bobby Boucher. Bobby Boucher is the devil. <laughs> water sucks. It, it really, really, really sucks. sucks. Gatorade. <laughs> Why are you saying Gatorade. that? Use it on the field. Um, <laughs> uh, water Boy, uh, another classic uh, Adam Sandler movie, when she plays a uh, young man that. Uh, Wants to be a water boy on a football team. And then takes all of the pent up rage and aggression that he's had for people making fun of him over the years and channels it into just knocking the shit out of people. So they uh, end up transferring him from water boy to middle linebacker yep. in the middle of the film and leads his team to the Bayou Bowl, I guess. I don't that's not an actual bowl game in college no, football, but, but it uh, saves money. It does. It does save a lot of money. And and uh, this will not be the last football movie on the list. It Spoiler will not. alert. This this might be for me. This might be his most quotable film. Um, it's, Happy Gilmore's got a lot. Yeah. But for for me, this just the amount of times that I've seen the water boy. Um, this might be my favorite of his. What, what's honestly. interesting to me is in 98, he he went. He played Robbie Hart, in which um, he actually, I think, yeah, you know, it was like a serious role. Like it was a comedic film, but a serious role. Mm-hmm. And then he plays uh, Bobby Boucher, uh, which is uh, kind of a, uh, it's like a really out there role, like uh, um, over the top, right? You know, and uh, I, I think that in '98, you for the first time kind of see uh, his acting range kind of start broadening out. Yeah, so. because the character is. It's it's got elements of his standard, very, you know, sophomoric, almost juvenile sense of humor. Um, But he actually yeah, but he actually he adds in some more subtle nuances with uh, the dialect he chooses to use and the fact that you see his body language begin to change a little bit. Um, I don't and you know what was interesting? I don't recall reading anything about him actually putting on additional weight to play a football player, but I do remember uh, his shoulder pads that they used are the same shoulder pads that a lot of linebackers used in uh, football back in like the seventies and eighties um, for extra protection. I'm sure they just used it to make him look bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I, I would agree. Yeah. You actually see him start flexing his acting chops mm-hmm. and, uh, and it, it was nice. It was a nice change of pace. And uh, Henry Winkler, of course, is just amazing in that. What, talk about a guy. Yeah, that, the most, most believable role in that entire movie is yeah. him. It's just like this defunct college team. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, and they drop the ball and they have time to pick it up and dust it off and run it down the field. <laughs> And then, um, oh, this is good. Yeah, this is really good. Then, uh, Kathy Bates is <laughs> Kathy mother, Bates right? is yeah. the mother in that. Yeah, and Kathy yep. Bates is always just a, a pleasure to watch on screen. Yep, yep. there's your there's Gladys. your Oscar winner for the movie. <laughs> Gladys, yeah. Gladys, who's Gladys? That that's that's my name, Bobby. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, Mama. <laughs> Something's wrong with his medulla oblongata. <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess tier one for oh, this everybody. Is tier one. Okay. It's, it's, yeah, and it, I can never pronounce her name, um, but his girlfriend in the movie. Uh, it's like Vicky. for Farisa Balk, Farisa yeah. Balk, Farisa Balk. Anyway, I always thought it was funny because uh, <laughs> a couple of years before that, she had been in a movie called The Craft, 
where That's she right, was just yeah. absolutely batshit insane. Um, and then to go to the water boy where she's essentially the same character, but kind of like in a fun campy, I'm going to be your girlfriend way instead of a, I'm going to kill you way. So it was, <laughs> it was kind of fun. Okay. All right. <laughs> Fair point, Michael. All right, Fair so point. I, I, I was also I, Dorothy Gale, but that's fine. So the first, this is the first one I remember her name in the movie was Vicky Valencoat. Yep. That double V. Just saying. Um, and uh, 1999 uh, saw Big Daddy. Um, what a decade, man. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, which uh, was a movie uh, where he played Sonny Koufax um, and uh, was uh, a man who lived in New York. And he suddenly found that he had a son that he needed to take care of. And well, no, no, no. He actually so he he was living off of a pension and excuse me, not a pension. He was living off of a lump sum he had received for a uh a cab running into him or a cab running over yeah. his foot or something. And it was actually John Stewart's son, who was his roommate at the oh, time. Oh, yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah. And they, deli- they delivered him because the mother of uh, of the little boy had died. Mm-hmm. And then John Stewart had gone to China on business. And so Adam Sandler pretended to be him and held on to the kid for a bit, ended up, you know, growing an attachment to him and so forth, the movie. Um, Thank you, Johnny. I'm sorry. I, to- I totally <laughs> just remember that from the end of the movie, not the beginning. Um <laughs> But yeah, uh, again, in this movie, I think Adam Sandler does a good job of kind of bridging uh, both like the kind of nearly kind of absurd level comedy, sure. not not quite there as it is in The Water Boy or uh, Happy Gilmore or something, right. but also uh, touches on the moments of the dramatic when he's like wondering if this could be his kid. Um, there's a courtroom scene when he end. loses the kid. Yeah, yeah. He, has a, he has a good monologue at the very end when he's yeah. talking to his dad, who's a lawyer um, who comes up and is. And is he's 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 talking to him and he, he's like, do you think you should own this child? And he's like, do you think you should be this, you know, the sponsor or guardian of this child? And he says, no, absolutely not. But I'm going to give it my best and blah, blah, blah. And I think between that and the wedding singer, those were the first opportunities that we saw him be able to show true emotion, uh, something that he hadn't something really that probably. I would assume took a lot out of him um, just based on his limited pool of experience doing that in other films. It was nice to see. It was nice to see that change. Right. Yeah. And I've, I've always said that comedic actors uh, mm-hmm. always have a really easy way in to it's a good transition to, to drama because uh, yeah. you let your guard down. Mm-hmm. Like if I watch a movie with Daniel Day Lewis, you know, it's I'm not going to if he starts cracking one liners or telling right. jokes. I don't know what I do. I don't know what I do. I don't know what I do. I always, ex- I always know what to expect from him. I always know that it's going to be some very poignant mm-hmm. and in-depth look at how this person actually lived, um, but, and a dramatic interpretation of it. You right. know, and like when I see when I see someone like him or Will Ferrell or Jim Carrey, for example, three comedic actors who I thought have done a pretty decent job transitioning over to dramatic roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's surprising, and it's a nice surprise, yeah. you know? Yeah. It shows uh, they're not just a one-trick pony. Yeah, uh, Chris Farley did it in Tommy Boy. Um, yeah, he had, some, he had some nice moments, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, because it, it just it catches you off guard. Yeah. Uh, Michael? I agree to everything that's said. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, 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 it's fun to watch. Um, it's fun to watch anybody kind of stretch their stretch their talent or stretch into new areas that that they don't necessarily uh, perform in a lot. So it, whether you take a comedian and put them in a dramatic role or you take somebody who's more known uh, for dramatic roles and put them into a comedian role. Barry, I've talked to you about this before with uh, somebody like Leslie Nielsen, who spent mm. the vast majority of their career in serious roles as as a thespian, being on stage, doing Shakespeare plays, and then towards the end of his career going, you know, I just really like making people laugh. So suddenly he's going to become a slapstick comedian and and make some pretty successful films when it comes to money, not necessarily to quality, but um, it's just fun to see people do stuff that takes them out of their element. And sometimes you can get something really cool out of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, I, I agree to that, that it, it kind of shows you a, a new perspective on them that you didn't see before. <clears throat> so are, are we all pretty much all in agreement that big daddy is tier one? That's a tier one. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, I was like, to some of the one liners that can come from big daddy too, that you do, you know, when it comes to Adam Sandler movies and the quotes that come out of them, big daddy's not necessarily always one of the ones that you think of off the top of your head, but yeah. I still always love the line when he's, when she's uh, explaining to him about her new boyfriend and she's like, he has a five year plan. What is it? Don't die. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, when he's uh, watching um, uh, or his, the kid comes in and wants to watch his, 
little children's program it's like i like to hop 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 yeah. all day it's like <laughs> this is so fucking annoying it's exactly what a kid's program is exactly exactly and i mean you know it uh i mean you had the introduction of scuba steve who always said they didn't bring back any other any other uh, films, i'm scuba but, steve I'm scuba steve uh yeah tier one man yeah I, you know maybe one day there'll be a big daddy cinematic universe <laughs> <laughs> oh gary maybe we can we can combine that with the eye of the beholder cinematic yeah, universe that's true that'd be great um uh he also did in 99 a small role in deuce bigelow male gigolo Are we do you, do you really want to go over these really small ones where he had like one line in the movie okay <laughs> fine we'll skip that did you uh, say steak yeah, I was a mistake. <laughs> Let, let's let's uh, let's we will take a second to we'll pay homage to Adam Sandler because Happy Madison Productions has been the executive producer on I would have to say the majority of all of his SNL crews films. You know, when it came to David Spade, Rob Schneider, um, a lot of Chris Rock stuff. Uh, I don't know if I don't think he did anything with Chris Farley, um, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, he he had helped a lot of them kind of you know propel off the ground and yeah and one and of the things i more famous I really, than being his sidekick yeah and i really liked in his early movies how he always had all his friends in the movie yeah um because i think that really made it feel fun yeah it makes it feel like you're part of the crew because it's yeah. the same crew every single time so like um and we'll we'll get to this at some point too but uh alex bernstein who is his best friend from way back in the day um he actually had been god he's been I can't think of a Sandler film outside of, you know, the last five, 10 years that he wasn't in. And he finally got his shot with uh, grandma's boy uh, later on. And I know we'll kind of briefly go over that. Um, I can't, you know, outside of him, I don't really, I don't know any of the names of the other guys. I know their faces. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I know when I look at them, there's like three or four other guys that are not Rob Schneider, David Spade, Chris Farley, Chris Rock and all that um, that are usually in his stuff. Um, but they're always they're always a, a side character. You know, they're always they're always in it. They always have mm -hmm. to make some type of cameo. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I like that. It makes it seem like an acting troupe. It does. Yeah, that's right. nice. Yeah. Well, and it it's kind of interesting to me because when you think about the SNL alum, mm -hmm. right, the the folks who are actually on the show itself, I I would never think okay, Adam Sandler is the one who's going to be the most financially successful out of this entire yeah. group. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, you always I'm would have to guess that it would be somebody like Chevy Chase or it would have to be somebody like Bill Murray yeah. or, or even Mike Myers might be a little bit more successful. But I think Adam Sandler either had a really good agent or really <laughs> knew how to negotiate contracts and really knew how to get the most out of something. Because when you look at the list of, of SNL alums, even the top 10, I mean, the because Adam Sandler, at least this list is a while back, but had him at 300 million. Mm -hmm. Number two was Julia Louis Dreyfus, which a lot of people forget. I uh, was Where's on SNL for a while, but yeah. yeah, being worth 200 million. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it just starts going down, down, down. I mean, yeah. yeah, the top five are over 100 million, but you've got folks like Will Ferrell at 80 million. Wow, you know, Chevy small. Chase at 50 million. What? Like, I would have never guessed in my life that, that you know, yeah. Adam Sandler would be worth six times the amount that Chevy Chase is. But here we are. Well, mm -hmm. Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd, too. Like, I'm just surprised that they're that they aren't up there. You know, Tina well, Fey. Like, Dan right. Aykroyd I mean, is crazy. So Dan Aykroyd is crazy. <laughs> he's, he's he's met aliens. It's fine. That's yeah. He also has vodka. Um, but I mean, Dan Aykroyd is, is still worth one hundred and thirty five million. It's still a lot of money, but it's it's is it less than half. <laughs> it's less than half of what Adam Sandler's worth. Exactly. It's just crazy to me. It, and, you know, I think one of the things that I've always read when I check out lists of the nicest people in Hollywood, Adam Sandler is Adam Sandler and Tom Cruise are traditionally always at the top. I always every mm -hmm. list I've ever seen. They're always in the top three. I always just see the two of them in particular. So I don't know, maybe maybe. Yeah, he was he was good at networking, but he was also just a really down to earth nice dude that was not only funny when the cameras cameras were rolling but you know funny when they were off too um you know some some comedic actors just are not relatable i hear bill murray was okay when he was younger but he's also really weird and can be kind of uh yeah. kind of a dick not as much as chevy chase yeah um, I, I hear mike myers is really tough to work with i've heard that one too yeah, yeah. chevy chase i've i've heard the most negative things about um as as funny as he is i mean you know I, th I think the people that end up being i don't know the biggest dicks yeah maybe people just don't want to work with them anymore so maybe that's why they're not as commercially successful if you look at adam sandler and tom cruise 
both two of the most commercially successful actors of all time, not only just in their genres, but in general. Yeah. I mean, who would have thought Tom Cruise would be like one of the biggest action stars when, you know, you see him in the guy's like five foot six. Yeah. He's super short. <laughs> anyway, uh, m- moving on, moving on. Uh, we've digressed enough. Yeah. Anyways. Big, uh, yeah. So, so, so we, so big daddy tier one, um, skipping on down to 2000. All right. 2000 turn of the millennium, uh, little Nicky in which he plays Nicholas, little Nicky, the third son mm-hmm. of Satan, mm-hmm. Harvey Keitel. Yes. Good, good role in this. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, again, John. kind of, uh, going back to, uh, the roots of like this is just kind of a really funny show with uh it was it reminded me a lot of happy madison i yeah, thought those characters yeah. were kind of similar yeah um you know i the deep south, the deep south. <laughs> that was a Fried that was a pretty chicken. good impression can i get a round of applause you, you can edit that in later yeah you I, can I, actually I'm sure <laughs> let me make a note of that <laughs> This this was one of the ones that I had I had actually seen when I was younger and didn't like as much. I actually thought this was kind of the 90s were in particular the five year span of 95 to 2000 were his golden years. I thought those were his best films that came out overall um, personally. And I just kind of felt like this one was a bit of a dip off. I felt like he was just doing it for the commercial success because he was getting there at that point. Um, he just kind of you know picked script where he could act zany and that was that and even as a kid i actually watched it again recently about six months ago and i uh, went on a little adam sandler kick for a couple weeks or just whatever was on netflix and uh, yeah uh, you know this is a tier two movie for me um i would say after watching it again uh yeah it's a little I, too I, zany I, for me yeah I, I think it's tier two um just I like it, but I don't really like it Mm -hmm. is where I'll I'll come down on that. It it does have some funny moments like it's always fun to see Hitler shove a pineapple up his ass. It's always fun to see uh, um, Kevin Nealon with boobs on his head. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, again, kind of going back that it it was a little zany with that kind of stuff. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Tier two, uh, I think is where little Nicky's going to sit. Don't hear many people reference Little Nicky when they talk about Adam Sandler. Mm-hmm. So I think it's probably even borderline three, but we'll put it in a two. You know, you you could if you if if we dove more into it and spent more time on it, you could probably convince me of a tier no, three. Like, tier, tier three guys is like toxic, like all like we have okay. got some movies that are gonna be in tier okay. three coming all right. up. So don't worry about all it. Right. Safely at tier two. <laughs> don't, we'll, don't you worry. Yeah, Gary Gary's very adamant about this. He's very very serious on his stance for uh, where our tier three lies. All right. Sorry, what's next? Uh he just had a cameo in the movie The Animal in two thousand one. Uh, Another so, Rob Schneider film that he produced. Yeah. So uh moving on to uh two thousand two. Um mm-hmm. Punch Drunk Love, in which he plays Barry Egan. Big year, geez. Um now this is his first uh truly dramatic pure role. dramatic role. Mm-hmm. Um and this is a really great movie. I liked it a lot. Um he plays uh, a guy that's just uh he takes a lot of crap throughout the movie until at the end he finally kind of snaps and that's always fun to watch, you know. Um reminds me of myself. Uh <laughs> You, and, you just like it because he ends up in Provo. Let's be yeah, real. Yeah. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I think uh, I think he really did an excellent job on this movie and just straight up acting. Like, I think this is really one of his stronger roles that he ever played. And for me, it's definitely a tier one movie. He he certainly falls into the category when he plays when he's in dramatic roles. He usually find here, at least early on in his career, when he's tried to flex his dramatic chops he fell into the the niche of a very timid and docile character that yeah that has that gigantic build up at the end that just explosion um and if actually you know if if you look at it he had already had practice with those characters that had that explosive anger when you know he was in like happy gilmore for example or um you know, in Big Daddy, they they had and Waterboy, obviously. Yeah. Um. This and this was actually I don't think he ever did another movie with Paul Thomas Anderson, but this was a PTA film. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um. And yeah, you know, man, I I remember I've only watched it. I think I've only seen it once. Maybe I saw it twice. I don't. know. Anyways, I do. I do recall. I, re- I recall liking it. I was like, okay, this isn't going to go out and win Oscars or you know cause people or inspire them to be actors or something or change lives. But it was a, I think it was a very nice film and his interpretation of 
of the script came across as genuine, and mm-hmm. it was a nice change of pace for him. First one. Michael, have you seen the movie? Uh, no, but I do remember the uh, I do remember the hoopla around it back in the early 2000s of just being a, a dramatic film that he eh, dramatic, eh, still kind of comedy uh, film that he was going to be putting out. There's going to be a little bit more serious, and I remember it bombing at the box office. Just mm-hmm. well, not like, yeah, great. Well, I think the problem was uh, that Adam Sandler's fans a lot of them wouldn't like this kind of a movie and the people that right. would like this kind of a movie wouldn't go see it because it had Adam Sandler in it. Yeah. It seemed to gain a bit of a cult following once it came out on DVD. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, I, I do recall a lot of people talking about it more and more about a year or two after it had come out. People had a chance. They're just like, oh, I'll rent it from Blockbuster, yeah. you know, because we were still around that time yeah. when Hollywood video and Blockbuster were a thing. DVDs and, were little discs that would have <laughs> movies on them. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Tell me about the time of your grandpa. Yes. <laughs> uh, I also think that Punch Drunk Love kind of moves us into a new uh epoch of adam sandler movies because i think kind of little nicky closed out his first era and i I think punch drunk love moves into a more um generally mature uh he's starting to adam sandler starting to get a little bit older and kind of approach the roles a little bit differently and if, if you look at it though for the most part every year that he did one of those really dramatic roles. He also followed it up in the same year with releasing a very comedic role mm-hmm. um, and kind of a goofy one, which we'll get to in a second. But I would agree with you. Tier yeah. one for me on Punch Drunk Love for sure. Uh, OK, tier one for Punch Drunk Love. Uh, also in 2002, he uh, did a remake, uh, Mr. Deeds, where he played Mr. Longfellow Deeds, uh, who's a uh, man who inherits a lot of money and uh, <laughs> buys everybody. Uh, what were they? Ferraris, Camaros? I think there were think Ferraris, Ferrari, a bunch yeah, of red sure Ferraris. Ferraris. Yeah, but he inherits he about forty billion. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> he inherits about forty billion dollars from his great uncle Preston Blake, uh, and then he doesn't hadn't even met him before. But Winona Ryder plays his love interest in that, and she's a reporter that goes undercover to cover his story, and then they end up revealing that she is a reporter all along, and shenanigans once again ensue. Once again ensue. <laughs> um, I think Mr. Deeds, uh, it, you know, it's a it's a fun movie. I, I for me, it's tier two. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I have uh, to agree with you. The uh, I think if he'd have taken out some of the stuff like the whole foot gag. Um, yeah, yeah, with the, the whole. I mean, they're channeling. I guess they're channeling their Quentin Tarantino uh, a little bit because John Leguizamo's character, right, um, John excuse me, John Totoro, excuse me. Um, you know, he he talks about his fetish with feet yeah in a light playful manner right yeah but it just wasn't yeah, you know, as playful as you can be sure yeah as playful as you can be with a foot fetish um yeah. I, it just I, wasn't I, needed yeah I, I i think if they'd have taken it more serious and mm-hmm. more romantically sweet i think that would have been a much better uh avenue to go yeah. with uh but, but again as you said he likes yeah. to balance out his dramatic roles punch drunk maybe, love. maybe if they had released mr deeds in uh in the following year or two years after that or something yeah maybe it would have made a difference yeah uh so for me it's tier two michael do you have any thoughts uh no i mean you pretty much covered it although uh have you seen mr deeds goes to town the 36 film <laughs> Yes. Yes. <laughs> so would you prefer to watch Mr. Deeds or Mr. Deeds Goes to Town? Which one's a better movie? Mr. Deeds is more entertaining. That's mm. for sure. It's probably it's not a better movie, but it is certainly more entertaining. Yeah. What what do you think? I have no opinion on the matter, but I am I'm the one asking the question. questions here. Yeah. Gary's like, I'll oh, run this interview. No, I, never, uh, I never saw Mr. Deeds. It wasn't uh I don't know. I kind of fell off the Adam Sandler bandwagon after the 90s where I was like, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, don't didn't really, I feel like I needed to go see a lot of the movies. I ended up seeing yeah. them later on uh, DVD and all sure. that, but didn't go see them in the theater. OK, uh, so tier two for Mr. Deeds. I'll agree with you, tier two on that one. Uh, I don't think it was it certainly I th- it was a cash grab. It was one of the earlier cash grabs that he attempted to do. Mm-hmm. And we'll see a lot of those over the next 15 years from now yeah. <laughs> until the you end got, of this episode. You got to support those drama roles somehow. You gotta, That's true. You got to the big hit they take. <laughs> um, and also in 2002, uh, he did uh, eight crazy nights, which was a cartoon about Hanukkah. 
uh, in which he voiced Put multiple on characters. Your yarmulke, uh, it's time for Hanukkah. He, as Johnny said he and he got to uh, kind of show his music uh, musical chops a little mm-hmm. bit. Um, and this was a, a fine, a fine movie. It was I a think. fine cart. It was a, it was a nice little cartoon. Um, nice was, little holiday yeah, cartoon. It movie. was, it was, it was, you know, innocent in the sense that like, there wasn't like uh, a lot yeah. of adult humor, like a lot of his other movies. There was a, yeah, there was enough. It was certainly in a, it was, yeah, it was like an adolescent animation yeah. film. It was yeah. definitely for like, it was, de- it was definitely aimed at teenagers for sure. Um, which, which again, you know. to me just shows like, his range you know he was trying yeah. this was a new thing that he was trying to expand into. well his i think his his marketability for sure they're just yeah, yeah. they're absolutely just showing that he, there's there's really not many age ranges that his his himself you know his style uh that he can't reach you know outside of the geriatrics i guess i don't know yes <laughs> um i would i would from yeah i would i would say this this would fall into tier two for me um only for the fact that his eight uh, eight crazy nights song itself i still know the entire thing mm-hmm. um i'm not gonna sing it right now it'll take too long but regardless <laughs> uh that was a big thing that was a big thing back when i was uh in eighth grade when that came out okay maybe freshman year i can't remember uh yeah for me uh you know tier two uh, mm-hmm. i think this is an enjoyable movie i don't think the world is worse off for it having been made yeah <laughs> michael i've uh, Never saw it. Okay. <laughs> Boom. Um, he all right, uh, also in 2002, he, ooh, he did yeah. five movies. Uh, he had a small cameo in The Hot Chick. Yeah, that one's kind of. We're going to move we'll on move. past that. An- another, you know, but he did, the, you know, same thing like Joe Dirt, Deuce yeah. Bigelow, um, Deuce Bigelow, European Gigolo, same thing, The Animal, The Hot Chick. Anything that David Spade or Rob Schneider did, um, in particular those two, or they were involved with, he's going to have a cameo outside of outside of producing it. Uh, just because there's friends. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, it's then like, in 2003, um, Polly Shore is dead, uh, where he played himself. I think that is a, um, kind of docu mockumentary yeah. or sorts. Yeah. I, I did not see that one. I, I would skip ahead to anger management because couch was a short film and Polly Shore is dead. He wasn't, okay. I mean, he was himself. Anyway. Okay. Uh, anger management, 2003, he plays Dave Busnick. Um, a man that has anger issues, mm-hmm. uh, teamed up with, uh, Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson who is just, just awesome on <laughs> everything he does. I love Jack Nicholson. Who doesn't? Um, and, uh, you know, kind of going back to the more adult humor, I suppose. Sure. Um, it's got a lot of really funny parts to it. Like, I yes. can't remember the lady's name that was wearing like the Boston Red Sox. Uh, oh, bikini yeah. Heather or whatever. Graham. Heather yeah. Graham. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's like eating fucking <laughs> chocolate cupcakes. Like, you, am I so disgusting? You won't even have sex with me. And he's just like, <laughs> you want me to be fair for you? I'll eat like a little piggy. <laughs> he's just like, whoa. <laughs> uh, that was, that actually got me singing I Feel Pretty to myself walking through the hallways of school all the time because of that scene that they stop on the mm. Brooklyn bridge. Yeah. <laughs> and he and Jack and I was just like, he's like, sing. Yep. Are you fucking kidding? Sing. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And just a, a really lot of interesting moments. I think that it had kind of a weak ending, but. Oh I, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, it actually had a really weak ending. Uh, John C. Riley was in it as well as yeah. the guy who used to uh, like beat him up and they go out to the, he <laughs> becomes a Buddhist monk and like. <laughs> Pants him. <laughs> yeah. Like. I, I laughed pretty hard when I saw that movie. It, so. it just baffles me the the caliber of actors that Adam Sandler is able to pull into his films because outside of Jack Nicholson, you had Marissa Tomei yeah. was in there as the love interest, and then I mean we talked about Kathy Bates yeah. earlier. I, I and, mean if if you calculated it, he's probably worked with more Academy Awards than anybody else. I don't know the exact number, so I can't yeah. dispute any of but that. He's just got but, such a a broad category of like. Academy Award winning people. It is a broad array of people that he's worked with. Very true. Absolutely. Uh, for for me, anger management, I think, is a tier one movie for him. Tier one, really. I, I'm gonna say tier two on this one. Only okay. only because I but see, that's the thing. You know, I even say to myself when I get angry sometimes, goose for a bot. It never works. No. But and you get angry a lot. I do, especially like when I play this football game or basketball game. It was college day. basketball. Yep. And yeah, I was certainly yelling at the TV a bunch. Um I yeah. was trying to run my Roman Empire on Crusader <laughs> Kings, and you're playing this basketball game? Being like, fuck, are you kidding me? Come on, ref, you didn't see that. 
Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I'd stick with tier two on this one for me. I don't think the the character wasn't as memorable as some of his other ones. And I think for tier one, I'm going to try to stick to a solid, you know, 10 to 15 films. And I don't think it falls in there for me personally. Okay. I mean, okay. you could you could make a good argument for it teetering on the edge, but I, I'm going to go with tier two. OK, Michael. I think it's interesting that Johnny will put it into a tier two because listening to some of the other movies that you talked about that involve Adam Sandler, um, you talked about specific memories that come up after seeing the movie and stuff that impacted you as a kid and in high school and all that. And the way you just described anger management was the same way you talked about the water boy was the same way you talked about big daddy, like was the same way you talked about those other films that were in tier one. So I think it's interesting that you see anger management as a tier two film when you have very similar memories associated with it for the other tier ones. Sure. Absolutely. And I, and I mean, I'll, I'll tell you why. I mean, number one, the ending that Gary pointed out, I would agree with you till I'm blue in the face that the ending on that was just really weak. Um, and the other thing was those other ones made me, they either made me laugh so hard that I was in stitches or it made me, it made me feel inspired or feel some emotion very strongly not all of them but a lot of them um and anger management didn't really do that had a lot of really i mean i love love the song had a lot of really quotable lines um but adam sandler just kind of plays a regular normal guy and um i don't know it didn't really it just you know when someone says let's watch anger management or they're like let's watch the water boy or 50 first dates i'm like yeah on the latter two not on the first one so good point though yeah i mean i yeah certainly Certainly was around that time that I was obsessed with uh, a lot of his films. Michael, where would you put it? I haven't seen it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we're uh, uh, we're at a, a disagreement. We're at uh, between a tier one and a tier two film for anger management. That, that we are. Uh, in 2004, uh, he made a movie called Fifty First Dates, mm-hmm. uh, which is his second team up with uh, Drew Barrymore. Um, in my and like I said, in our romance films, I mean, Fifty First Dates. That's, I mean, I think that's one of the best rom coms and best romance films in general ever made. Yeah, um, it's just a very sweet and endearing script and great soundtrack. You know, mm-hmm. really, really authentically genuine characters. Um, Drew Barrymore just she's always just the sweet. She's always the sweet girl next door, and it was nice to see in that one they they gave her some uh, some one liners and zingers that 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 were nice you know they had the famous uh one last first kiss line in the rain before he leaves for good and that one i'm not gonna lie that one that one got me a little bit i got a little, little choked up i was like oh well well one last first kiss. uh now is i i can't remember it's like towards the last third of the movie that he finds out she's got um sort of recurring amnesia right no it's the first third of the movie <laughs> Yeah, he he figures it out yeah. uh, early on in the film after talking to the father and the brother. But uh, mm-hmm. it's towards the later third of the film when he starts tr- convincing the brother and the father that they need to stop this, the the constant recycling of the day over and over and over again and slowly start letting her move forward. Mm-hmm. Right. Because I, I think that film has just such a it has a really strong ending it does. When, when Drew Barrymore wakes up and it's like play this video and Mm -hmm. it's her talking and uh, like all the memories and everything. And they're on the boat with the kids Um, and the grandfather. Yeah. Or the, her dad. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just, it's one of those really, it's one of those truly feel good films that I, I smile a little bit every single time I see it. Doesn't Mm -hmm. matter how many times I've watched it. Um, Yeah. This, this is a tier one for me. This one isn't really, in much check for me personally. Yeah, I, I, I'd say solid tier one for me as well. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. I really uh, surprisingly uh, saw Fifty First States relatively recent within the past couple of months for the first time, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a thought it was a fun movie. Like the the premise may have been a little over the top, but it was mm-hmm. still uh, it, it was still fun. Okay. Like yeah, I just I enjoyed watching it. Okay. Uh, so tier one for Fifty First Dates, uh, two thousand four also had Spanglish, um, mm. mm-hmm. which uh, mm-hmm. uh, this is probably a tier three movie. <laughs> this is a tier three, and it, it's see Johnny. I told you they were going to be coming. You're up. right. You didn't look, believe. Me. Look, Spanglish was not an absolutely bust of a movie. It 
it was it was the only time I've seen him go after a dramatic role, and he's only done a few, but it's the only time I've seen him go after a dramatic role and just kind of flop on his face. Mm-hmm. You know, I it, it it was not a very authentic performance. He he kind of his line delivery in the crucial, like pivotal scenes where you're supposed to, he's supposed to humanize his character with the audience. The delivery, it just kind of came across as forced and a little fake. And I don't know this me personally, but I would agree with you. I think this is a tier three as far as it's not on the level of like a Jack and Jill. Yeah. But which, this is sort of like the first garbage movie, right? As yeah. far as just dramas go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know overboard uh, was, was yeah, going say, overboard. Shakes yeah, the going clown. Overboard. Yeah. Shakes the clown. Yeah. What do we say? Mixed mixed nuts or something? I can't remember. Well, once he but, sort of had creative control. Sure. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. I, I would have to, I would wholeheartedly have to agree yeah. with you on tier three for this one. Michael, you were in agreement? In agreement. Okay. Not a great movie. <laughs> uh, 2005 had the longest yard, uh, oh, another yeah. remake, um, in which he played uh, Burt Reynolds' character. Burt Reynolds was also in the film. Uh, yeah. He, she, yeah. He, re- he didn't reprise his role, but he reprised a role in the movie that's true yes <laughs> yeah. just did play himself yes because he was too old <laughs> uh and yeah uh you know i i had a lot of nostalgia for the original longest yard and i haven't mm-hmm. seen uh the remake all the way through so i will stop talking about this one the remake on this one honestly it i i was i was already at this point 2000, 2005 i was already big into football as it was but this was the first time I had actually seen a sports movie where they had used the slow motion, uh, the slow motion uh, frame rate and whatnot when they were running with the ball. So like when the running backs, especially when um, some rapper, it was it was it was some rapper that that I, I, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. Nelly was it? Nelly, Nelly, thank you. It was Nelly. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, so Nelly and then, you know, they cast, you know, I love Terry Crews and anything he does. Um, Michael Irvin was in it. Uh, Bill Romanowski. A lot of these you know, are famous, football players. A lot of famous NFL players outside. of. Well, I guess Terry Crews was for a little bit. Um, but it it got me wanting to go out after seeing the movie and go play tackle football with my friends. In fact, that movie inspired Treese and I to start having those weekly football games that we had at that soccer field okay. over in Oak Hill. Yeah. Yeah. When we were like senior, like juniors and seniors in high school that we used to do every week. Um, cause we were like, Holy shit. Why, why haven't we been playing tackle football recently? It's we been can hit years. each other. Yeah, exactly. We can send people to the emergency room. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, it's always nice seeing, seeing Chris Rock and Adam Sandler be in a film together. I was actually upset that they didn't do more together in the two thousands. Um, and the fact that you know his Netflix movies and Grown Ups are are the primary films that I've had to watch with the two of them in because I like both of them individually and together they've got really great comedic chemistry. Um, so I mean, f- this one though, just based off of film standpoint, I am going to say tier two. Okay. Um, right. Even though same same thing. I mean, Michael, right. you could, yeah, you could throw the same argument in there that I had with anger management. Um, but just from a film perspective, uh, it's not as memorable, I don't think, as as some of his other films. So I would I would have to say tier two. Michael? I'm one of those, uh, I think it's a tier two as well. I'm one of those weird people that actually prefer to watch the, like the 2000 movie, The Replacements. Yeah, that was a, the that's a great art, yeah. Which is sure. essentially, it's a very similar movie. Like it's, it's, it's not 100% the same, but it, it's definitely similar enough to call them, you know, <laughs> the same movie at this point. Sure. But when you talked about the, the slow motion with the ball, everything, I'm pretty sure they did that in The Replacements too. Um, yeah, they, yeah, they did. I, I, they did slow. They did that with a lot of the like the passing routes. But there was a certain frame rate that they had used in that one when especially during Nelly's scene as the running back where they slowed it gotcha. down when he was running. And then after about two or three seconds, they would let it go back to normal speed and then he'd just take off running. That was just freaking cool. Um, so I, they, they gotcha. probably used it in other films beforehand. That was just gotcha. the first time I had. Seen yeah, it. yeah. The longest yard I would put tier two. Um would rather watch the replacements though. Mm. Yeah. Replacements. Awesome. Replacements was probably a better movie. Uh, moving into 2006, uh, the movie he did was click, uh, which a man play, uh, has control to fast forward and rewind time with the touch of a remote. Um, this is a fairly middle of the pack movie for me, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's not great. Uh, it's not great. Okay, would you would you would you do tier three on it? I uh, 
okay, maybe you're right. It is middle of the pack, but it's just, I don't know. It, it didn't really click with me. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. We lost Michael and we can never have him back again. It, it did a good, jo- it, it had the, it had the opportunity to hit you with that raw emotion, whether it be, whether it be, you know, whether it's a comedy, whether it's drama, whatever, it had the ability or the potential to hit you with that raw emotion. It's a guy who wants to skip all of the little things in life so he can get to the monumental aspect or the monumental spots in his life. And, you know, it shows that while he skips through the little things, then he loses the relationships with his children and ends up divorcing his wife. And Sean Astin takes over and, uh, <laughs> damn you, <laughs> Sam his- Wise. <laughs> and, uh, it had the it, it did have the ability to do that. And I, I I would have to agree. I don't think it did. I I, I don't know where I don't know where in the film it, it kind of lost its way because the message at the very end, I thought could have been much more clear and concise. And it could have really done something that a lot of his films haven't been able to do mm-hmm. with an actual, you know, good, wholesome message at the end. And yeah, I think they failed with it. So tier two for me. OK, tier two for click. 2007, we have another one of those years where he uh, does either end of the spectrum, uh, Rain Over Me, um, which uh, uh, was a drama, and I'll let Johnny talk about that because he seems excited. Uh, Well, actually, it was the one below that I was going to Oh, my God. Okay. (laughs) Uh, But I can talk about Rain Over Me if you want. Um, Rain Over Me was just another buddy drama film uh, that Adam said it was his... Third foray, I suppose, at the time into the dra- dramatic world. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had starred in the film with Don Cheadle. Uh, y- you know, you had I think Liv Tyler and Jada Pickett Smith were in it, I'm pretty sure. Um, been a while since I've seen it. I saw it in theaters one time. And yeah, I mean, he he's this autistic dude, essentially, that. Um, oh, did he play a did he play a violin? Or something like that. He, he played some musical instrument. Yeah, yeah. And um, anyways, he's supposed to like, Don Cheadle's supposed to like help him along. And in turn, Adam Sandler's character actually helps Don Cheadle be, um, begin to soften up and, you know, spend more time with his family. And it's just the, just the classic mm. buddy comedic film, you know, yeah, I, or buddy drama film, excuse me. I, I, I think this was definitely Adam Sandler's second attempt at an Oscar. Um, yeah. Yeah, Punch, Punch and, Drunk Love being he, the first. Um, and I think he probably thought nah. when he read the script, he was like, this could be kind of Rain Man-esque. Yeah. You know? um, that's, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's probably pretty accurate, actually. <laughs> but didn't quite make the cut. No, I mean, he fell, he fell short again. It was the same thing with Spanglish. It, it just seemed he tried to go instead of the everyday father like he was in Spanglish he went the opposite route. And like you said, he tried to play, tried Mm -hmm. to play a rain man or an I am Sam kind of thing. And it just came across like he was taking, he was taking uh, Bobby Boucher and Mm -hmm. making him a little little less smart. Yeah. That that may be because that's the role, a role he played earlier. And that was so iconic for him that he couldn't play anything that, is even remotely similar to that, even if he was coming at that from another end. And that's the sign of a truly great actor is the fact that they're able to take bits and pieces of other roles and create something brand new. But I thought he just took that role and just slapped a carbon copy of it into a dramatic script. And I thought it just failed. I don't think he did work on it. What I'm saying is if you'd have never seen Waterboy and then just saw uh, Rain Over Me. Sure. Like it's impossible to answer that, but like, you know, how would you have, seen it then I it, wonder. it wouldn't have changed my perception of the movie that i thought it was it just was a poor opportunity i mean he he went it's kind of it's kind of like robert downey jr in tropic thunder when he when he says don't go full retard uh-huh. you know and it's it's not that adam sandler's character was supposed to be completely mentally challenged he was more you know he was more artistic than anything else um but he went too far with it you know it, it just became it became like a farcical almost he just went really over the top um mm-hmm. and he didn't tone it down and just kind of make it middle of the pack when he needed to right and then only go over the top in those moments he had to and i think as we see him go further along there's there's other dramatic roles that we're going to come across later on in his career and and you'll see okay he's starting to get it now right you know, he's starting to finally you know he's starting to tap into what he had in punch drunk love which i actually thought in punch drunk love his character didn't really the 
I guess the the lengths that he was able to go to, you know, it it was all he stayed pretty close to home. He stayed pretty safe with it. You know, he didn't really have a a large range of emotion, you know, and rain over me was the first time that I saw him attempt to have a large range of emotion throughout the entire thing. Mm -hmm. I thought in punch drunk love, he had really the same range of emotion for the first three quarters of the movie. And then we saw the final scene and then tiny, tiny snippets peppered in throughout the rest of the script. Um, so I thought it was, he just, he tried to do, he did a perfect amount in punch drunk love. Uh -huh. I thought that was why it was his best role. Cause he, he wasn't quite there yet on the dramatic level that some other actors were. So he was taking it slow. He was taking yeah. it bit by bit and rain over me. He wasn't there, but he decided to try it anyways and mm -hmm. a valiant effort. I mean, good try, but okay. Failed. <laughs> um, for me, it's a tier two movie. Like it's not horrible, but it didn't quite get to where I think he was trying to go with it. Uh, th this one for me is, is teetering on the edge. I'd, I'd probably still say tier three, just because as far as dramatic roles go, if we're just saying, because we, we got a lot of movies to go. Hey, we put Spanglish in, in tier three. So I'm just, I'm just saying, oh, I think okay. that it's right. fair. I don't know, but yeah. Okay. I'll say tier two. Sure. Michael. Yeah. It's, it's probably a tier two. It's rain or me feels like all of the pieces were there. Mm -hmm. Like every, everything was present to make it a really good movie. It just didn't quite jive up. Um, uh, I think if he took a second chance, uh, you know, a second try at it, could probably do it a little bit better, but it just didn't work for him in this case. Yeah, probably. Okay. So tier two for Rain Over Me. Uh, in 2007, he also made a movie that would never get made today. Uh, I now pronounce you <laughs> Chuck and Larry, which is about two super straight guys uh, who uh, pretend to be gay. <laughs> And uh, try and bilk the uh, state of New York out of uh, pension, uh, pension and marriage yeah. uh, monies. Uh, this was uh, for you kiddos who are too young to remember before gay marriage was legal in the United States. And I think it was about life insurance, not fucking pension, but OK. Uh, it makes it sound like they're like criminals trying to go after this shit. <laughs> Well, well, technically, what they were, they were doing was illegal. State, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it might have it might, it might, yeah. Yeah, been life insurance. Yeah. Um, Anyways. Yeah. And so uh, you got two, two, two guys that are not gay and they pretend to be gay. And um, the hilarity that ensues there. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, tier three. That's all I'm going to say. What? Really? I Okay. What, 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 Johnny? What? I, I, I loved I Now Pronounce You, Chuck and Larry. I thought it, every single time I watch it, it still, still has me in stitches. Okay. It's still funny as hell. <laughs> uh, maybe it's because they, this is honestly, I thought this was one of the best casted supporting role, like as far as supporting role characters that Adam Sandler's had in some of his films. Um, you saw Ving Rames came in uh, and had some really memorable moment, moments. Um, I, I really, I personally really love Kevin James. I think he's I, not as much as Adam Sandler or uh, or like Will Ferrell or anything, but I do like even Paul Blart Mall Cop, I thought was really fucking stupid. But I took still, an oath. No one gave you an <laughs> no oath. One gave I made you one an oath. oath. <laughs> I made my own. <laughs> and it was that it was that type of uh, film for me, you know, uh, you know, Steve Buscemi and Dan Aykroyd turned in some of their best supporting role performances, uh, I thought, for any Adam Sandler film. And I, you know, just honestly, this teeters on tier one for me. I, I still watch it to this day when when I see it come on. OK, um, I might have the, to rewatch it then, because the, the, the two of them, the two of them together. For me, it's like Chris Rock and Adam Sandler. Uh -huh. I like Kevin James and Adam Sandler together. I think they, their comedic they do chemistry make a good. good. Pair. Yeah, I just think they're funny. Um, it, it's absolutely not an amazing movie, mm -hmm. but for Adam Sandler standards, this would tier between <laughs> tier one and two for me i i i'd probably i'd probably put in the tier one it might just be a personal preference i don't know okay michael what? thoughts i i like it it's it's cheesy stupid movie that's a uh, it grows on you over time um i'm with johnny i like kevin james i think i think he's i don't know he's got a lot of potential i think he could get some better roles if people would just mm. give him a chance at it but I don't know. I liked the movie. I thought it was fun um, because it's that it's that idea of uh, you spin the web of lies, but then you've got to spin it further and further and further and further just to keep covering your own tracks. It keeps getting more and more absurd and more and more absurd and finally just teeters over the edge. But it's fun to try to keep uh, see him keep up with it. 
and uh it's 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 got a lot of fun moments yeah okay so where do you put it uh put it as a high two low one all right okay so we've got one two and three on the movie all right all right um well luckily though we move into 2008 and he was only in one uh well, I guess he was two. in two movies. Uh, the first one is You Don't Mess with the Zohan, <laughs> which I think is really the first solid, solid uh, tier three movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I still like it. <laughs> you did? It's a tier two for me, man. Oh, my God. Kiss, kiss foot. Kiss foot. Kiss uh, foot. <laughs> so he plays a... Uh, He's an uh, Israeli, Israeli Masad, commando. A, a, yeah. ass- assassin yeah. uh, that moves to New York and becomes a hairdresser. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, just a lot of ridiculous fight scenes and uh and it but i just i love it i love this this is the thing like you you give the opportunity you give john tortello the chance to come in and and pick the rest of the movie up for you because yeah the script is weak as hell don't get me wrong a lot of adam Adam sandler's scripts are weak but i think the performances are what drive them home um and they're just from some of the greatest comedic actors of all time john tortello i've always thought excuse me is one of the most underrated, um, not only actors, but comedic actors in particular, um, just between Big Lebowski and uh, even his performance in Mr. Deeds and this, you know, it, the majority of the scenes, they don't take too long in Adam's, most Adam Sandler films, they don't really concentrate on the romance story if it's not a Mm rom-com. And I appreciate that in comedies. I think romance stories as a sidebar, especially like in action films or horrors or comedies are, unnecessary to spend you know 20 minutes of the entire film on that you really just a couple lines here a couple looks there and then just stick to the 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 meat and the meat and juice of the the meat and taters the meat and taters. <laughs> taters. <laughs> taters precious um and yeah this one this one did it. it it's a it's a tier two for me um pretty solid in the middle of tier two i would have to say okay okay michael <laughs> God. So he he pretty much was like, hey, guys, remember (laughs) six or seven years ago when there was this movie that came out called Zoolander? I bet we can do that. And I bet we can do it better. All we didn't. (laughs) <laughs> but we made a shit ton more money than Zoolander. Like, if if you're gonna watch, you don't mess with the so just watch Zoolander and and have a better time watching the movie. Although like, in Zoolander, they steal a joke from the Flintstones, where Fred Fred Flintstones like, if you build a house this small, how are people gonna live in it? I just want to put that out there. I'm done. <laughs> so everybody steals from everybody, is what I'm hearing. John Goodman stole from no one, sir. <laughs> He, never does. he stole my heart. Oh, <laughs> King Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> what the bowling alley? It's great. So, um, where do you put this one, Michael? Three. Okay. All right, Just so, go watch the Lander instead. Okay. Uh, one vote for two, two votes for three. Um, and then, uh, of course, we've got to do a kind of more serious one uh, in the same year uh, Bedtime Stories, which. Uh, was sort of a not a serious one at all. Well, I think it's, 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 it's not a heavy drama. drama but I think I think it's not a drama. Saw that on Cinemax late night one year. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's not serious in the terms of a drama, but it it's uh like an actual like for children, I guess. Oh, it, yeah, it was certainly it was it was yeah, it was one of the few times that he actually did a children's movie. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, I would have to agree. It was it was certainly more of a children's movie than his standard mm-hmm. teenagers early 20s audience for sure. Yeah. Um uh, I think for a children's movie, it was pretty decent. Yeah, it's a tier three. I mean, it's just, it's blah. It, there's not a ton of funny moments. It's not super memorable. It kind of just, if people were, they're like, someone walked up to me and said, oh man, God, do you remember Bedtime Stories with Adam Sandler? I'd be like, barely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's a well, movie. <laughs> Gary, you should absolutely love this movie. It's a Walt Disney picture. Oh, was it? I oh, don't shit. know what that means, Michael. <laughs> you love everything, Walt Disney. Okay, okay. Uh, for me, this is tier two. Johnny, tier three? Tier three on this one. Absolutely. Michael? I've never seen it. Okay, all right. No um, desire. <laughs> uh, 2090 did Funny People. I uh, haven't seen that one. Very, very depressing. An incredibly <laughs> depressing film. Um, uh, this is, it's... Mistitled. It, <laughs> well it's it's about comedians adam sandler's lead comedian he's been diagnosed with some terminal illness uh and 
he finds Seth Rogen on the circuit. Seth Rogen steals material from Jonah Hill. Um, and he basically, Seth Rogen becomes uh, Adam Sandler's somewhat friend and protege, but really Adam Sandler is kind of a shitty person. And then in the end, he redeems himself. And it was fine. I've seen it a couple times, actually. Um, saw it once in theaters, thought I'd give it a second chance because I like the cast and I like Judd Apatow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just thought it was one of Judd Apatow's Probably his probably his weakest film, honestly. It was they tried to come they tried to make it into a dark, like a black comedy. Um, but it, it just it wasn't funny. Like there really weren't any it was just really depressing. I remember watching it and being like, I wish I could have two hours back. Okay. Um, All right. But the script wasn't bad. It just did a horrible job at being a black comedy. They should have either gone zany with it and made it into a comedy or just kept it as a drama, honestly. Um tier two for me. I, I'd say probably in the middle at tier two okay tier two uh michael have you seen that i have not okay. I'd, I'd rather watch his other films yeah okay. i don't I, I wouldn't recommend it's one you can skip <laughs> speaking of which 2010 growing ups uh, <laughs> uh this film he kind of yeah. is more of sort of the ensemble friend cast um he's he's got a lot of uh people that he's worked with that i suppose he likes in person yeah like uh you know kevin james uh the, uh, and the the role that was actually written with Chris Farley in mind, he wanted Chris Farley to do it. Yep. And then obviously they, you know, he and Kevin James. So this movie was in point. development for like twelve. No, no, years? no, 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 no. When he, when he was writing it, he originally a lot of the so a lot of the films when Adam Sandler would write, he'd have particular people from his past that he would put into the characters and then write around their personality and their behavior and habits and stuff. Okay. And when he was writing that character that Kevin James portrayed, he had Chris Farley in mind. He just had said that in, in a couple interviews that I had watched on it because I was excited for it when it first came out. And I'd say it, you know, bottom, bottom tier two for me on this one. I mean, it's a you know, there's funny moments. It's a good cast, but it's a movie that you could have changed the entire setting and just kept those five actors in and just done something else i would have rather seen them do a remake of fucking ghostbusters or something i don't know just like <laughs> with the, with those five you know you throw rob schneider in as rick moranis's character uh-huh. and then you throw the other four in as the other guys and i don't know that would have been better it was fine it was a movie that happened and it i didn't hate watching it yeah that's the, about all i can say the comedy in it didn't get me in stitches like yeah. some of his other comedy did yeah um, I think it is a tier two movie. Um, and I don't hate my life for watching it, <laughs> but I, but, nor do I feel yeah, like I was edified. Michael. Hey, it was tier two. I, I do. Uh, it's probably even tier three. You could probably it's make not it great. It's, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. I mean, again, I like Kevin James, like Adam Sam, just no. Nah. Yeah. Rob, it, it didn't really hit. Rob Schneider just had a random role in that trying to, I don't even think he was trying to revive his career. I think he just was bored because he hadn't been in anything in a while and just did it. Just did it to do it. Fair enough. <laughs> Good enough to make a sequel though. Yeah, mm. apparently. Um, okay. And then in 2011, uh, he mm-hmm. dumps Drew Barrymore and picks up Jennifer Aniston in the movie. <laughs> just go with it. Uh, which is another rom-com, which I have not seen. <laughs> Tier three. Tier three. This okay. one was just so this one right when Gary said it, I just told it I held up three fingers. I was like, that's that's a tier three got written tier three all over it. Um I like Jennifer Aniston and his chemistry. Um they actually were friends back in the late eighties, early nineties. Because <laughs> and so right. And so uh, uh Adam Sandler's friend was dating Jennifer Aniston at the time, so they met right before both of them actually hit it big. Uh and so you can kind of see that they had some tr- genuine authentic chemistry and so that was cool but i mean i remember seeing this and outside of just ogling brooklyn deckler the entire time um there was not really much in any way of anything in this film i don't know maybe it's just because i love drew barrymore so much as his you're like stop cheating on drew barrymore <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> adam sandler <laughs> i don't care if it's it hotter it doesn't matter <laughs> drew barrymore's your soulmate don't man. you know that can't you suit see that you belong together <laughs> Okay, so oh, thank you, Kramer. <laughs> tier three, <laughs> tier three on this one, guys. Sorry, uh, sorry, Nick. Tier Swartzen. three. Um, <laughs> uh, and then in 2011, he did another movie called Jack and Jill. Um, this, one, this one you love, which uh, <laughs> with Al Pacino, <laughs> which is a a movie uh, for Don't which. 
<laughs> for which the lowest tier is named. Um, and it, it, it's a, uh, it's a, a deep delve into the psyche that connects uh, fraternal twins, um, Jack and Jill Sedelstein. Sedel yes. Um, and how their relationship has evolved over the years and what their family and parents have meant to them and what they're looking for in the world and how they can interrelate with each other. No, that's not it at all. It's just a bunch of really oh, dumb. That was all bullshit. Yeah, it's just awful <laughs> yep. and just filled with a movie. A movie so bad it killed Regis Philbin. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And uh, it's got uh, uh, Al Pacino. Like, there's some more Oscars for you. <laughs> <laughs> and Adam Sandler twice. Yeah, he's trying to channel his inner. Eddie Murphy and Arsenio Hall, I guess. I I, I don't know what. Trying but, to play multiple roles. Ah, uh, uh, just um, painful, excruciating. This might this might be his worst film. This is his worst. Honestly, film. it you might be correct. his worst one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, bottom. So, yeah. Bottom of tier three for yeah, me. On this, this is one. the this is the gold standard of tier three. <laughs> Michael. Tier three. It's yeah. it's. The reason they created tier three. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, 2012. Uh, uh, he did a movie called That's My Boy, um, <laughs> which he plays. Uh, was, he, was he a drunk in that? Yeah, he was. Yeah, just yeah. Sort of, oh, he, yeah. He, he had been he had been uh, essentially raped by his middle school teacher when he was like. I don't know why I left that. But okay. <laughs> Jesus, that's the kind of show we have for you tonight, people. Where we talk about sexually molesting. Uh, let's let's, let's stop just there. keep going. Johnny. Let's not. Let's not. Uh, brought to you by Johnson and Johnson. <laughs> brought, to by Blue, brought to you by Blue Apron. <laughs> um, th he's he's essentially sexually molested by his. <laughs> by Quit going over his, this part again. <laughs> so he was sexually molested by his middle school teacher, and she ends up getting pregnant, and he's only. 13 years older than uh, Andy Samberg, who plays his son. And uh, it's about his son getting married and the, the father and son reconnecting. Um, on, honestly, it's it's a stupid movie. Vanilla Ice is in like three quarters of it. And he plays himself and he's supposed to be good friends with Adam Sandler in it. And I've actually heard Vanilla Ice is a douchebag. I know a friend of mine who smoked pot with him a long time ago. I'm shocked. Said he was, yeah, but... Honestly, I, I give it tier two. I, I laughed a fair amount during this movie. Um, the concept is quite stupid. Uh, it's just ridiculous, but it's one of those ridiculous Adam Sandler films that I just love. You know, he has that the, the standard, the standard Sandler. Yeah, <laughs> the standard quirks of Adam Sandler. And uh, he brings them back. Yeah, I hadn't seen those in a while, so it was uh, refreshing. OK, uh, uh, it's border tier two. Tier three for me. Fair enough. Um, yeah, I'll go tier two with that, Michael. <laughs> yeah, we're we're gonna go bottom tier two, tier three. It's it's tier three. I do I do love the statement in here when people are talking about it. Critics felt sick after watching the movie because Sandler wanted them to. <laughs> what? <laughs> now that's, what? The, that's the mark of an actor that can control your not only emotions but your physical responses absolutely maybe it's tier one i don't know <laughs> maybe maybe it's vulgar trite misogynistic hacky tacky it's great <laughs> tier one <Boom. laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> and in addition to that movie uh also for the kids he did a, a voice of count dracula in hotel transylvania i thought i thought it was a a splendid little animated children's film i mean you know as far as kids movies go yeah i'd say it was tier one but as f compared to his other ones it's we'll tier give it we'll give it tier one for kids movie tier two for a sandler film okay I i'm good with tier two for this uh you know just sort of the standard children's film yeah i mean it you know it was like uh God, i'm trying to think of, it certainly wasn't a pixar movie but it was like shrek three i guess would be a comparable comparison all right okay so he was it was fine it was good you know i was like okay i can see why a kid would like this it had a few jokes for the adults and you know took all your favorite classic halloween characters and oh. made them into very enjoyable and light-hearted individuals very good very good <laughs> michael do you have anything for hotel transylvania 
just um, amazed at the uh, voice cast on this. It's quite a, it a is quite issues. the cast. I mean, like Molly Shannon, Fran Drescher, David Spade, Coffee with John Lovitz, Chris Parnell. Like, there's just quite a few people in here I didn't even know were in it. I didn't even know Fran Drescher still did anything. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Janice slash the nanny. <laughs> um, 2013, uh, back by popular demand. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, Grown Ups 2. I, I enjoyed seeing Shaq in this one. And for some reason, they added Taylor Lautner from the Twilight series in there as the lead of the fraternity house that they're... Uh, fighting with throughout the entirety of the film. It's uh, certainly a film and it's a it did exist. top tier three, I guess <laughs> <laughs> it was. Um, yeah. A, a sequel that did not need to be made. Right. That was quite unwanted. Tier yes. three for me. <laughs> yeah. It does have John Lovitz in it though. It does. Keep does. Pointing this out. Yeah. Every movie that John Lovitz comes up in, we have to make sure. Uh, sure to name him. 2014, uh, he uh, goes back to Drew Barrymore in the uh, movie Blended. Uh, I actually never even heard of this movie, so I don't have anything to say about it. I saw it one time on a plane, and that was probably good that I saw it there. Um, if you had to compare all three of Meg Ryan, and, if you had to compare to Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks, the three that they did, and then the three that Barry Moore and Sandler did, this would certainly be on the level of, uh, I guess, Joe versus the Volcano, but Joe versus the Volcano was, you know, not bad and pretty decent and a lot better than Blended. Um, I'm really not going to say much more than that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're not on the same level at all. <laughs> so really not the same level whatsoever. I was just trying to think of something to say because there's really not much to this film. Uh, I forgot most of it. And I know that it actually made a lot of fucking money. Um, let's see what Wikipedia is saying. Yeah, the budget was like $40 million and the box office was 130 I don't know why, but uh, maybe it's because they hadn't done a rom-com together in a while. A cash grab on this one. Certainly a cash grab. Okay. Uh, Michael, do you have anything for Blender? Tier 3. <laughs> I don't. Okay. Though, uh, cash grab is probably the best way to describe that, I guess. If, yeah, people were going to try to compare it to other trilogies and other major... Other trilogies. Major Jesus actor X. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, is this in the extended universe? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, also in 2014, you did a movie called The Cobbler, in which you played a uh, shoe repair man, which is known oh, as a cobbler. men, women, and children. What? You forgot men, women, and children. Was that really like a movie? It's a movie. It's a Jason Reitman <laughs> film. Oh. Ivan Reitman's son. Oh, okay. Uh, I have nothing to say on that, Johnny. Okay. Uh, it was it was actually not bad. Um, the movie as a whole. I guess, now, you know, I guess that it doesn't make any sense to talk about it. Adam Sandler's role <laughs> was not really that big. Um, it was good. It was a drama. Um, it was just about kids growing up in you know, the mid 2000s and how texting had started to become prevalent and um, sexting became a big thing. And so they kind of briefly scratched the surface of that in the film. Um, Adam Sandler just plays the father of the main kid. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was a tier two for a drama. So anyways, whatever. We'll OK, on past that <laughs> men, women and children. I'd check it tier out. Two. I mean, yeah, if you're a fan of Jason Reitman, then then I would I would check it out. It's a decent film. OK. Uh, the cobbler uh, is uh, he's fixing shoes and uh, yeah, tier three, tier three. So I'm not going to go into this one. Tier three. The, the title. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, here's right. your Oscar, Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> like, yep, yep. <laughs> the title really explains the entire movie. There's nothing. There's you know it. This it's not an ambiguous title by any means. It's pretty direct, and that's what it's about. It's mm -hmm. about a guy that makes shoes and delves and. <laughs> Made one point two million dollars. Why? One that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's horrible. One point two million. Yep, with a budget of ten. Yep. Tier three on this one. <laughs> yes. Um. And I, I think uh, so. We're moving into twenty fifteen, and I think this is sort of the third age of Adam Sandler. Um, yeah, we're starting to see. We're starting to get more and more depressed for sure. 
um, he makes a, a movie called Pixels, which I really, really like. I Pixels. really enjoyed Pixels as well. Um, mm. It's a very nostalgia based movie mm-hmm. uh, about arcade games from the 80s that uh, aliens from space saw the transmissions of those and they built their uh, ships to come and I like the premise sounds stupid. Yeah. But uh, the movie was actually a lot of fun. Um, it was good. once again, we get to see Kevin James Kevin pairing James. with Adam, Adam Sandler. And you get a nice, you get a nice role from Peter Dinklage. You oh know, yeah. He Peter honestly, Dinklage. his character might've been my favorite in the movie. Um, he plays the guy that uh, basically beats Adam Sandler in what it wasn't it was galaga the, galaga that's right was yeah that? at the world championships yeah. of arcade gaming back in the uh, 80s and he comes and he redeems himself and you know get to see uh, josh gad and brian cox in there and mm-hmm. michelle monahan and it was a nice little cast yeah it, it, was, it was a really fun movie like yeah i i remember going to see the movie and being so unexpectedly pleased with it yeah. Which I think is a mark of a uh, a low low bar that you've set for yourself on the career, and so when you make a decent movie, people are really shocked by it. The budget was around a uh, hundred million. It looks like they made about close to two hundred and fifty million at the box office okay. on this one. So I know Rotten yep. Tomatoes was not a huge fan of it, but it did pretty well. And most people that I I know that have seen it, have, they share I think all of our sentiment that it, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, for you me, know. solid uh, solid it, tier one. It was a good. It was a good movie. I mean. I just I'm wondering how much of that was Chris Columbus um, mm-hmm. when, when you've got him at the at the helm of it, because, of course, you know, you've got Sandler producing and all that kind of jazz. But um, Chris Columbus is a, he's a good director. Like he's he done a lot of really good stuff. Which, Miss Doubtfire, Gremlins, um, uh, what, the first two Harry Potter movies, I think. I mean, he's he's a fairly good director. So it's interesting to see him in something this kind of uh, outlandish for lack of a better term, yeah. and being able to pump something out like this. Like, it was a good movie. Okay. I, uh, I love it how Chris Columbus's production company is called 1492 Pictures. Uh-huh. What, <laughs> what else would you call it? That's, that's well, yeah. You could probably call it anything, but yeah. that, very clever. Indigenous Pictures. Oh. Columbia Pictures. Oh, no. Oh, oh no. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to, I'd almost agree with you, Gary. I'd say high tier two. Um, really? For me, I don't think I'd put it in the tier. It's not one of his best films of all time, but it's certainly a very oh. enjoyable movie. I, so. I would probably put that in his top five films. Oh, no, not even okay. close for me. But but yeah, no, it, it was a good movie. I enjoyed watching it. Okay. I would see it again. <laughs> all right. Um, moving on, uh, Hotel Transylvania 2, a sequel. I never saw it. I Nor did I. <laughs> Michael, it's all up to you. Did you see this movie? <laughs> Which which Hotel Transylvania two is this what we're saying? <laughs> yes. Let's just uh, no. Let's skip this one. <laughs> okay. No one's seen it, and it's the first one was enough. <laughs> yes. Um, then he did a movie called The Ridiculous Six. Yeah. Yep, uh, yep. Which is a spoof on The Magnificent Seven. Um, <laughs> it was quite horrible. Yes. This is. But a, it was funny. <laughs> I liked it. it this to me is a. Uh, uh, it's a tier three, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't. Call it I can't it see it's tier two. <laughs> yeah. It's tier um, three for sure. It, it's a Western movie that's, they try and squeeze in a lot of this bad comedy. And yeah, uh, yeah. they try to throw in a bunch of, for his supporting Oops. roles, they throw in a bunch of actors who actually he hasn't worked with before. And I thought that was a little strange. Yeah. Um, and it just, it didn't hit home, but there were still, you know, it's an Adam Sandler movie. So there's still moments that I thought it was funny. He wrote it. So <laughs> it's always going to be somewhat entertaining. I feel like uh, the ridiculous six is when after that was done. I feel like that's when Adam Sandler decided to take Taylor Lautner out back and just put him out of his misery. Yeah, because I don't think you see Taylor Lautner in pretty much anything after this. Yep. He had he had done that and the grown ups too, and I guess that was it. That's the end of Taylor Lautner. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard from again. How do you liken this? Oh, oh. oh. Moving on to 2016. <laughs> Um, he did a movie with David Spade called The Do Over, which was an action <laughs> comedy. Uh, this one I did not see either. Um, Same thing. It was it was uh, it was on my my uh, Adam Sandler trip. Where yeah. I was just went for like four weeks. I just watched a movie of his every night because I, it There's was sixty uh, of them. Yeah, <laughs> it was stupid and ridiculous and didn't need to be made. But I still I still found myself chuckling and high tier three okay it, it's it, it you know it wasn't it wasn't great but it wasn't it wasn't horrible okay michael did you see the do-over 
I sure did not. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, moving into 2017, we have Sandy Wexler, mm-hmm. uh, which was a comedy about a guy named Sandy Wexler. He plays a talent. He plays it like a talent acting manager out of L.A., and uh, he's just he's supposed to it's supposed to be a spoof on uh, the old like Jewish talent agents and stuff that they had out in the yeah. 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, the guys with the big, thick horn rim glasses or excuse me, the thick gold glasses and hairy arms and the right, curly yeah. hair, the little star David uh, gold chain around their around the neck. Um, and yeah, I mean, he essentially just defines talent and just tries to make it the best that he can but he's actually not the best agent and he's super annoying and overbearing and it it was fine um it's one of those things it's low tier two high tier three yeah um, yeah there it, seemed to be a lot of those i would he, agree with that it, it was kind of it's the same thing we go back to with netflix just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks and uh-huh. when they gave him that 250 million dollar deal to do those four movies this happened to be one of them and i think they filmed all of them within like 24 months of each other 24 hours yeah, yeah. 24 hours yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah that that's my take on it okay all right i agree low tier two michael tier three sandy wexler was sure. was not great they yeah. tried real hard uh, they got a lot of a lot of people to be a part of it you know terry cruz and arsenio hall and it, no it just Ron wasn't Schneider great again yeah like it just it was whatever <laughs> Okay, um, moving on to uh, the Mayorwitz stories, new and selected. I have not ever heard of this movie um, or seen it. It's a Noah Baumbach film. Oh, um, Dustin Hoffman, Emma right. Thompson. <laughs> yep, yep. He's actually he actually Dustin Hoffman does does like to do stuff with him. Um, but yeah, you know, I have this is actually one of the few movies of his I have not seen. I've heard, I, I've heard of it, but never saw it. So I can't comment on it. I don't know. Okay. Michael, once again, <laughs> it's all on. up to you. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Next one. Oh all right. Gosh. We're almost done. <laughs> um, puppy, which that's is a, that's a short <laughs> film. Let's, <laughs> let's move past. <laughs> okay. Um, the week of uh, 2018, the week of, uh, in which, uh, this is the, this is the best of his, this is the best of his collaboration for Netflix out of the four movies he did, this was the best one. And this was another Chris Rock one where he got in on it. Um, they're basically Chris Rock's son and Adam Sandler's daughter are getting married. Uh, Chris Rock is a very successful surgeon and he offers to pay for all this stuff at the wedding. Adam Sandler has, it's like middle class, upper middle class, uh, just big, big Jewish family, you know, living out in New Jersey um, or New York, wherever the hell they were, same area. And uh, yeah, and the entire family comes into town and Adam Sandler ends up housing like 40 people at his home and things go wrong the entire time. And it's, it's a barrel of laughs. I, you know, I, like I said, I like, I like when Chris Rock and Adam Sandler actually get together and, and do something. So tier two for me, okay. um, so solid, solid in the middle tier two. I have not seen this one. So Michael, it's fine. Neither have I. Okay. If uh, you're going to watch one of the ones on Netflix, this would, this would be my recommend. This would be, Probably my recommendation of the ones to see. The week of. Okay. Yeah. So tier two by Johnny B. Yeah. We're going to skip Hotel Transylvania three. Okay. Summer vacation. Uh, moving into 2019, uh, Murder Mystery, which okay. I think this was one of the Netflix ones he did. It was actually. And actually yeah. this one. He goes back to Jennifer Aniston. He does go back to Jennifer Aniston. Uh, what is this guy doing? He's playing the field. He's playing the field. Aniston, Barrymore, then well, a bunch uh, of other random yeah. people. <laughs> um, basically, yeah, they're just a couple that hasn't taken a, they haven't ever taken a trip anywhere. And for their honeymoon, Adam Sandler had promised all those years ago to take a trip to Europe. And they're Jennifer, like a middle class couple. So, I mean, like, I need to be lower than that. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, th- this is like a big thing for them. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. And they they essentially go to Europe and stumble upon. Basically, it's a murder on the Orient Express but on feel a yacht. to it, but yeah. on a yacht. Yeah. Um, but, and it, it wasn't bad. It actually it had some good moments. I mean, like I said, the even with just go with it it's the same thing the chemistry between aniston and sandler is there but the script in this one is probably on the level of the week of i would still say i like the week of a little better but you know lower tier two i would have to say for murder mystery see yeah. it if, see it if it's if you're just hanging out and you want to see an adam sandler movie i'm gonna give it a, a solid tier two i think <laughs> uh 
I think it's enjoyable. Yeah. Oh, you did see it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, did. I watched it with my dad, actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, it wasn't bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was fine. Yeah. It was fine. It was fine. <laughs> yeah. That's about it. I feel like that's a lot of his movies, Uh, you know, post-2005. <laughs> uh, Michael? Uh, did not see it, but amazingly enough, written by James Vanderbilt. Really? Yes. Of, of the Vanderbilts? Of the Vanderbilt. Um, also wrote one of your yeah favorite right? did he yeah because he no. wrote zodiac oh, okay yeah okay. wrote zodiac uh i guess the amazing spider-man's right uh the one with the Andrew one dude Garfield. that no one likes yeah yep thank you yeah yeah those ones are weak <laughs> white house down weak. Bad, was in zodiac was was fine pretty good um and then uh the latter half of 2019 um <laughs> one of the last movies that i I think I saw in a movie theater. Like yeah. New movies. Yeah. Um, before un- the world ended. Uncut Gems. Yes. Uh, My God. Let's talk about Uncut Gems for a second. Let's talk about <laughs> how Gary almost had a heart attack and a seizure at the same time. Yep. From at, we got out of the movie and Gary just started chain smoking immediately. He yes. didn't even wait till we left the lobby. He like lit a cigarette <laughs> on the way out the door yeah. and he's like, Oh my, it's just, he's just shaking, just, con- just convulsing everywhere. And he's like, he's, I, I never had a, a moment to, to take a break. Nope. They didn't give me a chance to relax. Not, <laughs> and he's just not one second. He literally smoked half a pack yeah. of cigarettes in about 10 minutes. Yeah, it was, that <laughs> I've movie- never seen you inhale <laughs> cigarettes that fast, man. That, that movie is just a never stop stress fried like <laughs> it's like you're edging the whole time but on a heart attack instead of anything else that you might edge on that's the cool oh, thing okay <laughs> that's the cool thing with with you know dramas or actions or psychological thrillers mm-hmm. is that even though they're high high octane intensity coming at you non-stop they do allow you one to five minutes of rest at different, you know, peppered in throughout the film. Mm -hmm. This one didn't really give you an opportunity to rest. It just kept coming at you. Um, It's like one of Tom's D and D campaigns. You go from the (laughs) frying pan to the fire all the time, all the time, all the time. Um, It was nice to see once again, uh, I think going back, showing that, um, people can surprise you. A uh, famous basketball player, Hall of Famer Kevin Garnett was in this movie, and he actually did an okay job. Um, he played himself, granted, but it's a drama, so it's not. You know, he was in a fair amount of the film, had some pretty, uh, some pretty dramatic, over the top scenes, and I thought. Adam Sandler had said, if I don't get an Oscar nomination for this film, I'm going to do Jack and Jill too. So the world's fucked the, the way because it's coming out. Um, he. He certainly, I think this was his strongest dramatic role. A little, I honestly thought it was stronger than uh, Punch Drunk Love. Yeah, and, I, I, I agree that this was. Yeah, this was his best run at the yeah. Oscar. Um, and I, I really he's not did done. Think, I think he'll yeah. get another couple chances. So far, though, right, right, yeah. and I would agree with you. Um, for me, I thought it's hard to say what was better between Punch Drunk Love and this one. They're both so different as far as dramas go one was like a dramatic romance this was just a straight up psychological drama um i would still this one is tier one for me i mm-hmm. did enjoy it a lot uh, i thought it was a strong script i really like the safty brothers that that directed it they've done uh, a couple other really good indie films over the last decade and i you know god i don't know hmm. very different films i think his performance was better in uncut gems i'd say punch drunk love was better as a movie on on whole but still they're pretty tight. Mm-hmm. Tight race for me. But tier one, I would say. Michael? Uh, Gary's edging scared me off of this, so I did not see it. <laughs> okay, so oh, then I will Gary. talk about this Yeah, movie. Gary, why don't you give everybody so, an insight? I have a brother named Adam, and Adam <laughs> Sandler has always reminded me of Adam in a lot of ways. Outside of their first names. Because of the night? No, uh, <laughs> just, just the way they act. Okay. And uh, when this movie came out, my brother and I were opening up a business, and um, you know they they make things happen, they make things move, and um, like it it just it really reminded me of Adam in a lot of wonderful ways, and I love my brother, but my God, uh, this and uh, it was funny because I was telling Adam, I was like, Adam, this movie. It's you. And he's like, what are you talking about? And so 
um, he saw it a few months later and he's like, yeah, that's me. So we sent a bunch of memes back and forth of, uh, mm. this is how I win kind of thing, <laughs> you know? Um, so to me, um, the movie, because of that has a special place in my heart. And I, I think it's Adam Sandler's best movie overall. And, um, are you saying as far as dramatic films go yeah, or just best movie in general? Dramatic films. Okay, yeah. Gotcha, yeah. Gotcha. Um, and I, I, th- I think that he genuinely really, did a, a good performance in yeah. this and tried. He worked his ass off yeah. on this one. You could actually see it pay off mm-hmm. throughout the film. Yeah. And I was very surprised, very yeah. pleasantly surprised. And it was just a, just a really uh, a well put together movie. It had an interesting, intricate story. Um, so to me, it's it's uh, it's uh, the top of tier one for me. Yeah, and I don't since it's so new, I still don't want to go too deep into the synopsis. Right. On it. Let's yeah. people go. You know, go check it out if you get the chance. Yeah. Um. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. Uh, yeah. Just make sure you buy a new pack of cigarettes before you do. Yeah. Or, you know. Yep. You know, take Good a, for the kids. You know. Yeah. Or, you know, shoot up some heroin so you stay calm. Yeah. You know, yeah. Smoke a lot of weed. Because really, the movie never stops to let you catch your breath. We're not joking. It like, really it's two, doesn't. It's like two and a half hours. And it's just like, it's like crank, but like to the 10th But degree. you're sober the entire time, even though you don't yeah. feel sober coming out of it. I've never I seen you leave. Crank. I've never <laughs> seen you leave a theater so quickly. Yeah, like we honestly. get up and usually like we'll take our time. We'll let we'll we'll see movies and like we'll we'll let other people let, walk out of the theater so it's not a huge rush. We'll watch the credits. Gary didn't even let the the uh, starring Adam Sandler or directed by blah blah blah. He immediately gets up when it goes black and makes a hasty retreat yeah. for the exit. Yeah. And- it was, it was, oh my God, it was, that, it was quite funny. That movie was so stressful the whole time, <laughs> uh, but a good movie. So, and then we are finally to the last movie of, uh, of Adam Sandler's current filmography. Everybody's favorite. The last in a long line of Netflix films, Hubie Halloween. Hubie! 2020. Um, you know, I did not see this. It's funny, you know. I I said the week of, and what was the other one? Murder mystery. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. But I I liked Hubie Halloween. I thought it was I thought it was really dumb. It had been a while since I had seen him go the route of the over the top, you know, the zany Mister Deeds, Waterboy, Little Nicky styles, right, yeah. and it was nice to see him do that again. Um, you know, you have they brought back a lot of old a lot of old classic, you know, Steve Buscemi reprised a role. Um, they had, they had a lot of, Kevin it was James, a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. It's, it's a, it's a was good it family. Ray Halloween Liotta movie. in that? No. Oh, okay. I don't okay. think I thought so. It was. Uh, this one had Sandler. Kevin James was in it again. Uh, no, you're right. Ray Liotta was in it. Um, Rob Schneider. That's right. Keenan Thompson was in it for a bit. Uh, Buscemi, Shaq, my Rudolph, Tim Meadows, the the standard run of the mill SNL cast, right? And yeah, their supporting roles. Um, he just plays a guy that is obsessed with Halloween and is always made fun of in his town. But on Halloween night, he's the nicest dude around, and he basically protects the town and makes sure everybody's staying safe. Um, and then people start mysteriously getting murdered that have messed with him in the past, and. And uh, yeah, it's on Netflix right now, so I would I'd recommend I'd recommend checking it out. Tier two for me on that one. Tier two. Okay, yep. Michael, did you get a chance to see Hubie Halloween? I did not, but just uh, just reading about it, I may go see that. Yeah, go see that. Go I see may it. walk yeah. into my living room and see that. You just don't even watch have to it. do that. You can just pull it up on your phone yeah. and sit in your underwear and watch it while you eat Cheetos or whatever. It's not bad. It's zany. It's got it's the great. the classic Sandler quirks and yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, well, thank God we've reached the end of the list, but I think overall Adam Sandler is an actor that does have a very large range. I think sometimes he doesn't challenge himself as much as he could in making movies. I think when he does, um, he can really make a pretty good movie. Um, and I hope that he continues to challenge himself, not just in dramatic roles, but yeah. he's only um, he's only 54. So, yeah, he's still got he's got another solid, you know, two decades yeah. of, of making more films that will he be able to transition the comedy aspect, though, as he comes into the later parts of his life? Can because, he take on supporting roles if? Yeah, well, because yeah. he's always been so his comedy has been so young, like, right. Uh, 
you it's, know, it's Billy Madison kind of thing. Very true. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's very, it's very much like, very much like Chris Farley or Jack Black. It's very physical comedy. Right. You know, and he's not able to do that. Um, Dan Aykroyd and Will Ferrell, I think, are very good examples of people that have aged gracefully um, with their with their comedy type. You know, mm-hmm. they I guess Dan Aykroyd was never really physical comedy. Um, Will Ferrell was, though, for a little bit. Um, so, yeah, hopefully he can make the transition. But I'd say, yeah, the majority of his films. Yeah, I'd say they're mediocre, middle of the pack, uh, excuse me, middle of the pack comedies. And if you're a, if you're a Sandman fan, then if you're part of the Sandman fam, yeah. Tell me that's not a thing. It's not a thing, okay, but I might God. make it part. I might make it his fan club. He's now. just a grown man playing in the sandbox. He's really a grown man playing in the sandbox. Just destroys the competition. No, it, you know, Dennis Miller had made that claim on his talk show that Adam Sandler might be the biggest Hollywood. He might be the largest A list Hollywood actor ever because of the length of time that he stayed at the top and the length of time that he can bring an audience into a movie. Cause if you think about it, it's been going on for 30 years. We just looked at the list yeah. 89 or really 90 to now. And mm-hmm. he's still doing it and he's only in his mid fifties. So who knows? Maybe we've got another decade or decade and a half of it. I'm really not sure. But another we'll 30 years of Adam Sandler till he's 84. I don't know about that. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, Frank yeah. Langella, I mean, he's, Frank Langella is not an a he's not a he's not a superstar blockbuster actor. No, but he's still anymore. making movies. Is what I'm saying. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, Sandler. There's lots of actors that do that though. I mean, so, Clint Eastwood's really the only one I could think of that still does that. Yeah, to even this day in his 80s and stuff. Well, I mean, and to to keep it in perspective, Adam Sandler has made almost four billion dollars at yep. the box office. That's insane. God, and just by just his name. And, th- and that's not so. being in any major blockbusters, if you think about it. He's never been in like a major action blockbuster or yeah. anything like that. I mean, and well, he still brings in almost four billion. That's insane. That's ridiculous. I think it'd be neat if he was in like Doctor Strange 2. I think he would make a good adversary for Doctor Strange. I would like to see him play the antagonist in a film. That's I mean, he's got to get in a seen. Marvel movie at some point, right? I mean, everybody else has. That's Gary. I've never he thought about he that. Will never, he will never be as long as his contract, uh, any of his contracts state that he uh, is due 25% of the profits from the film. Oh, yeah. That's just not going to happen. Maybe when he gets older, he'll he, he'll just yeah. be like, yeah, you know, whatever. I want to, you know, I mean, you see a lot of actors go into that later on in their careers. They want to actually make an impact in an area of film or genre that they've never touched before. And um, that's actually really common for actors that had a really good run for their first, you know, 10 to 20 years. So maybe I guess we'll see soon. He's starting to his golden years are for his comedy, at least, are certainly over. So maybe we'll see him. Dive unless into the unless he can alter or, it like Jack Lemmon, uh, Walter Matthau. I mean, right. Yeah. You know, I think that type of comedy is just not it's not as popular as it used to be. And it's certainly not as prevalent, you know, like smart as, comedy. Yeah. I mean, you no, saw no, Michael, you're right. No, no, you? that's like all joking that's aside. You're, you're very right. That's that's exactly it. That's a, it's <laughs> unfortunate. I never stopped to consider that, but damn. We'll, yeah. We'll find out when Frasier gets uh, rebooted. Oh, you know it's going to suck. And we'll see. Well, I'm I don't so know. sad. I'm, I'm so sad they're remaking it. I mean, not remaking it, that they're adding a spinoff, like, or a, yeah. a second oh, iteration. Okay, so let's, let's wrap this up with um, oh, right. stating what our favorite... Like, if you had all these movies on VHS tape and you were sitting at your house, you know, you crack open a Topa Chico and uh, pick up some kale to eat, what yeah. movie are you going to watch? Just just your your favorite movie yeah, to watch. Hard. That is hard. Of Adam Sandler. Yes. Okay. Gone with the wind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to put in Happy Gilmore before I put in anything else. Okay. All right. And you know why? Right because on. Happy Gilmore accomplished that feat no less than an hour ago. No more than an hour ago? No more. Hmm. What the hell are you saying? Yeah, what, what are you talking about? Happy Gilmore accomplished it no more than an hour ago, you sons of bitches. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a line from the movie, Gary. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the hell are you talking about, Michael? <laughs> I was like, wait, what? And then I was like, oh, that's right. It's from the movie. Uh, Gary, what about you? Uh, you know, uh, Jack and Jill. Uh, really Come on, <laughs> get the hell out of here. God damn it. Uh, I, I'm going to definitely pop in The Wedding Singer. Um, sure. I, sure. I really enjoy that movie. Uh, it just makes you feel good. Um, and uh, it, it's fun to watch. It's, you know, a nice little romantic story that's got good music to it. And that's all you can ask for some days. And uh, that's my go-to Adam Sandler film. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, I, as much as I, God, as much as I love 50 first dates and both the happy Gilmore, um, would certainly be in my top three along with 50 first dates and wedding singers, certainly top five, but the water boy is always going to be my number one to go in. Um, God, and it's not just the fact that it's a football movie. It's just so quotable. And I think the star makes the movie for sure, but the supporting cast is what really gives it that extra oomph. And I think between Henry Winkler and Kathy Bates, you couldn't you couldn't ask for just a, a better supporting cast in that one. Uh, just so many memorable characters, and it always makes me laugh, man. But any, it's it's hard, you know. His 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 good ones are on another level for the comedic tier in particular, you know. Uh, so it's it's hard to pick. But I'd go Waterboy for sure. That's okay. My, so let's just say those will be our recommendations for the week. Yes. Yeah. All right. Waterboy, Wedding Singer, Happy Gilmore probably is possibly his three best yep. overall all of them made before 2000 all of them pre-2000 certainly his golden years but he has uh he's had let's hope that they keep making some stuff on the level of uncut gems uh um, no never make and, a movie like that ever again <laughs> I mean, we see him in more dramatic roles you know similar to that but uh but it actually i think it'd be interesting because they're uh supposedly making a galaxy quest 2 uh-huh. i think it'd be fun if adam sandler was the villain in galaxy quest 2 that would like be pretty seeing cool. him in a science totally fiction role as he yeah. trying to think of a science fiction role pixels i guess stands, maybe is the but, first maybe. Oh, but like serious he'd have to take it seriously it's galaxy quest i know <laughs> i guess you could yeah yeah I mean, that's a good point the, the, the bill, that's the whole point of the movie Zan, yeah not xandar but uh was it xander i can't remember xanadu no xanadu. <laughs> uh hang on antagonist in galaxy quest was uh Saris, 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 yeah, Saris, yeah, yeah, General Rothhahar Saris. Anyways, yeah, uh, guys, unfortunately, we are all out of time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this week, uh, Michael. Always a pleasure to have you on talking about the greatest actor to ever live, Adam Sandler, better than Daniel Day Lewis and Dustin Hoffman combined, and Gene Hackman combined, and John Goodman and Jack Nicholson. And I'm just going to name a bunch of people yep. until you all stop me. Okay, you can uh, stop. And John Edward Hawkins. Norton. <laughs> Uh, uh, for all of us here at I Don't Give a Flick, I'm Johnny. I'm Gary. And I am the spirit of Neil. He'll be back next week. <laughs> we'll see you guys next week as well. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to Lead Feather Productions' podcast of I Don't Give a Flick. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode. Podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts are hosted. I Don't Give a Flick is hosted and produced by Johnny Blackburn, Gary Elmore, and Neil Riley. Executive producer, Johnny Blackburn. Technical director, editor, and audio mixer, Gary Elmore. I Don't Give a Flick is a Leadfeather production. Copyright Leadfeather Productions 2021.